Coming to you live from the shores of the Great Salt Lake and broadcasting to all corners of the globe, this is Plural Side Live 2020. Now welcome your studio host, Don Jones. Hello and welcome to the preview day for Plural Site, uh, Plural Site Live 2020, the Tech Skills Conference. My name is Don Jones, and I am excited to be your host for three incredible days of connecting you with your peers and exploring the full power of technology. Today is focused exclusively on you, the developers, engineers, architects, and craftspeople living, breathing, and working with technology. To that end, we've made the entire conference free, and we're streaming most of today's content across a variety of platforms. Follow along using hashtag PSLive20. We have an exciting agenda, including breakouts with our authors, a panel on creating a more equitable workplace, and a talk with Dylan Beatty on why you should love legacy code, really. Now, by registering for the full conference, you can also play interactive games like Google Cloud Hero and AWS Deep Racer. And a bit later today, you'll get to see the exclusive keynote by inventor and robotics builder, Simone Yetz, something I personally cannot wait for. Registering will also grant you access to the next two days of live, where we're offering even more technology breakouts and our keynote with Grammy Award winner, actor and activist, Common. You can register for free by visiting PluralSiteLive.com. It's going to be an amazing few days. This year's event is all about seeing things differently. Ironically, we picked this theme long before the world seemed to change overnight and force us to literally see this event differently. Here's the upside to going virtual. You'll be able to remix your own version of Pluralsight Live. If you need to drop off to attend a meeting or you know, actually get some work done, we're recording everything for you. You'll be able to come back when you can and pick up where you left off, watch sessions in whatever order you choose, and truly make this a personalized experience. Even our featured keynotes will be available on demand until the 16th once you've registered. Now, by going virtual, we've also been able to expand the reach of this conference, and we're excited to bring the goodness of Pluralsight Live to a global audience. We have attendees from more than 130 countries joining us today. And well, you know it wouldn't be a tech conference if I didn't give a quick shout out to our partners and sponsors who help make events like this possible. Thank you to Google Cloud, Microsoft, and AWS. Lastly, many of you are probably aware that today is Ada Lovelace Day, a day to celebrate women and their amazing contributions to technology. So today's agenda is powered by our social enterprise, Pluralsight One, which is our commitment to drive significant, lasting social impact by helping people across the globe unlock access to tech skills. Now we do that through our product and our amazing partnerships, including Malala Fund and Norwegian Refugee Council, which do incredible work to improve opportunities for girls' education worldwide. We're collecting donations for these two organizations over the next three days and highlighting several of our amazing Plural Site One stories. Look, if having access to technology skills has changed your life and helped you see the world differently, then we invite you to help us change others' lives as well. You can learn more and donate to a meaningful cause by visiting pluralsite.com donate. Let's take a look at two of those Pluralsight One stories now. I run a nonprofit called Learn Afghanistan. We work with technology and digital literacy in rural and conflict zones of Afghanistan. We have had a lot of funds, uh, Afghanistan as a country, for having schools built, having teachers trained, but it never reached the rural areas, the conflict zones. So what we do is we share the tablets and the Pico projectors with children in districts. They take them to homes, to the villages, and then those Pico projectors and tablets are used whenever they want to learn. So you don't have to worry about, oh, if the school is bombed, oh, if the, the teacher, he's not available to teach. So uh, technology helps us in teaching children who are out of the touch of like the normal people. We reach all those children that are left out. 
With the Malala Fund, we get to learn a lot and that's what we are doing with Pluralsight right now. We are learning through your platform and we are using it for IT, we are using it for technology. It has been a help for young people because uh, we are young, we don't have that kind of training. We don't have access to all those opportunities. So Pluralsight and Malala Fund has made sure that we get to uh, learn through a platform that has good quality um, content. One thing that I surely believe in is like, if you're educating one girl, we always say that you're educating a generation. I don't just say it for Afghanistan, I say it for every conflict zone. We give them the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to be curious about things. I'm sure we are looking at future leaders who are gonna make smart decisions and smart solutions for Afghanistan and other countries. I founded an organization called Science Fuse. We work on enhancing children's scientific literacy and to change their perception of science and scientists in, uh, in Pakistan. Most of the children in Pakistan sadly go to government schools or low-income private schools where the quality of science and maths education is pretty dismal. So if you walk into one of our classrooms, you'll see rockets flying in the air, children working on, you know, designing their own experiments, exploding water, doing fun chemical reactions where, where you know, you see some Sometimes see fire, sometimes you see foam. And the whole idea behind this uh, curriculum is to change children's perception of science. It's not boring, it's not difficult, it's more than just a subject that they study in school. It's their ticket to understanding the universe and also to nurture critical thinking in them, to nurture their sense of wonder and their sense of curiosity. Now that the world has changed so much, we look at from Pakistan's perspective, for example, technology and digital uh, learning and, you know, distance learning has become the need of the hour. So for our team, this partnership uh, that Malala Fund has with Pluralsight is absolutely critical so that our team and our community of science communicators can develop some very, very crucial skills, which will help us in uh, further in creating those solutions, which can then have a very, very big impact on teachers and children in Pakistan, as well as to find out answers to all the complex solutions that our world faces today. Uh, so inspiring, and thank you for helping us. All right, let's get things going. We'll kick things off with our first guests of the day. Jeremy Morgan is a Pluralsight author, an avid car enthusiast, and the host of Pluralsight's podcast, All Hands on Tech. Jeremy is joined by one of Pluralsight's authors, Ned Belavance. In this session, they tackle how skilling up and staying connected has changed over the last several months. Jeremy, take it away. Next up on All Hands on Tech, Ned Bellavance. Ned has almost 20 years under his belt as an IT professional. Everything from help desk operator to systems administrator, cloud architect, and project manager. He has authored 17 Pluralsight courses and has his own show and two podcasts. Exciting stuff. So let's welcome Ned Bellavance. How are you doing today, Ned? I'm doing well. How you doing, Jeremy? Doing great. Doing nice, awesome. Nice. Glad to so, hear it. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Oh, geez. Uh, I guess the best way to describe me is a content creator and educator. The thing that I like to do most is to share my experiences and information that I've learned. And a lot of the time, it's stuff that I'm currently learning. For instance, I'm doing a series on my YouTube channel about raspberry pies, and I am not an authority on raspberry pies. <laughs> I am very much a learner, but I like to share that learning process with others because I feel like the best way to teach someone is to learn how to do the thing and then immediately share because you remember what it was like to not know how to do that thing. So that's, yeah. I guess, in a nutshell, that's <laughs> the best way to describe what I do. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I totally relate to that. Uh, a lot of times I'll write something in my blog and people will be like, oh, you know so much about this. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> I just learned this. That's why I put it up there. <laughs> but yep. let's work through it together. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You've been doing a ton of stuff on YouTube and, and online. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and what you're working on? Yeah, sure. So the newest venture, I guess that you could call it, is back in the beginning of April, I started doing a daily YouTube video. It's 10 minutes roughly, and it's Monday through Friday, and each day has a different topic associated with it. And I gotta say, 
Terraform Tuesdays are probably my most popular <laughs> the topics. <laughs> yeah. I get a lot of views on that. But I also do a tech analysis on Wednesdays. And if it's about a topic like Microsoft Ignite, perhaps, that ends up getting a lot of views too. So I've slowly been growing that. But I'm not monetizing it in any way. It's really just a way to give back and share with the community. Aside from that, I've been actively creating Pluralsight courses and refreshing some of my old Pluralsight courses to bring them up to date. And also doing some analyst work for a company called GigaOM. I've been doing benchmarking tests, which has oh. a whole other world of, hey, I'm learning how to do this thing while I'm actively doing it. <laughs> yeah, benchmarking is so fun. <laughs> it I, is. I, I'm one of those weird people. I think benchmarking is, is so fun. It's so awesome. The really interesting thing about benchmarking is not so much the speeds and feeds, because, I mean, those are interesting, but what really gets interesting is when you get into sort of the TCO or ROI of using different services and going, okay, I could tell you how fast this thing goes, but can I tell you how much it's going to cost you and whether it's worth investing the money to adopt it? That's a much more interesting and nuanced question. And that's kind of, I'm riding that line right now is, especially with cloud stuff, yes, you could adopt that new WhizBang service, and it does whatever Terra gigaflops it says it does, but it's also going to cost you an arm and a leg, and honestly, running it on like an EC2 instance with the DynamoDB table is going to be fine, so just do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's always the the challenge in consulting, I think, is, is getting to the why. Like, why, mm -hmm. why do you want to do this in the first place? What problem are you trying to solve? you know, ask those questions first before it's like, I need a Ferrari. It's like, okay, well, you're driving to the store to get groceries. Yes, a Ferrari will be awesome, but the Honda Civic will do the same thing. <laughs> you know, so. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it's that maintenance, right? I think there's a direct parallel there. When you over-provision stuff or over-build things, you're not responsible for maintaining that. And I guarantee you the cost of maintenance on a Ferrari is going to be way higher than that Honda Civic. Oh, yeah. For sure. So, so um, how has the pandemic affected the cloud world from from what you could see, like the you know changes? The biggest change for me personally is not going to conferences because I already worked for myself and I already worked from home. So not yeah. a big shift in that regard. But the way that I got to socialize and see other people really was going to conferences and meeting up with interesting people like you, Jeremy. That's, <laughs> that's how I got out and socialized. And to have that yeah. shut down, well, that was one of the uh, drivers behind starting up the YouTube channel it was I want to continue to communicate and talk to other people. Here's another avenue for doing that. And I've recently started adding guests to the channel on Mondays to talk about their best ever career advice and how they've uh, gotten to the point that they are today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I also miss conferences. And I've recently discovered what it's like to do a talk uh, remotely pre-recorded. And I would have thought, if you asked me last year, like, would you rather go up on stage and give this talk or would you rather pre-record it in your home and send it out? I probably would have said, I would like to pre-record it and send it out. Uh, but what I've actually found is it's way easier to get up on stage and start writing code and talking than it is to sit in front of a camera and record it as if it were live and produce it. Way more effort and pressure. <laughs> so I don't know about everybody else, but that's been my experience. Yeah, the biggest element of that and we'll get go on a tangent on about that, I'm sure. But <laughs> yeah. the biggest element of that is when you're on stage, it's live and you can't edit. Yeah. So whatever you say, you just said. Whatever you do, that's what you did. When you're pre-recording it, now you have the opportunity to second guess yourself, to take that second chance, to do editing. And that adds a whole bunch of time without necessarily adding a lot of value to those who are watching. I mean, you don't want to totally yeah. mess up, but... Some of those flubs are the things that make you human and relatable. And you can do that on a stage and you can also gauge audience reaction. And it's so sad not to have that with these sort of pre-recorded talks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will be ready to jump back on the stage and do it the old <laughs> way <laughs> when the chance comes. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty cool. So, um, so how are, how important are skills right now in transformation? So, um, before, you know, everybody's kind of on site and trying to do a cloud transformation. And it seems like with everybody moving from home, 
that just pushed everything forward and it like forced companies to start doing yeah. cloud transformations. Um, where do you think skills fits in with that today? More important, oh, less geez. important? Uh, more right? important than ever, I think. Gaining, gaining the right skills, gaining the right skills to advance in your career is more important than ever. And I think in a lot of regards, we're now responsible for being more self-starters than we necess than we were before, because we are a little more isolated. It is up to us to independently grow and adopt the skills that we need. And I think probably the most important skills are really around communication and clarity of that communication less so the technical stuff like the technical stuff is still important you have to be able to get that right especially if you're a practitioner but being able to effectively communicate with your boss and your team or if you're managing people those people that you're managing being able to do that effectively through a remote medium that's tough and so yeah i would definitely look into gaining some skills around that particular topic yeah and i, I think it is a little more challenging um like you said, when you're kind of on an island, because one of the things that I miss about working in an office with people is the water cooler chat. Yeah. And it's not necessarily like the Game of Thrones water cooler chat, but the how's the how's your Docker thing going? Or, you know, how's your Kubernetes instance going? Or or just hearing people talk and then kind of absorbing it and saying, okay, everybody keeps talking about Postgres lately. Like maybe I should go <laughs> figure out what that is, you know. So yeah. I yeah. think it is more of a challenge now to even know, you know, what are people talking about and what are they doing in real yeah. life? So. so many times when I was doing a lot of consulting, I would be talking to another consultant while we were in the office on the same day about our, you know, various projects that we we're working on. And they would help come up with a solution for a problem I was having or vice versa. And it was because you were drawing on that additional knowledge that each person had. That's hard to recreate that <laughs> in, a, in a remote setting. But I think it is possible. And I think part of that gets back to communication and creating events that people feel comfortable socializing in while we're all still remote. Yeah, definitely. So what does your learning plan look like when you decide you want to learn something new? Um, you see a new technology like Postgres or whatever, you know, <laughs> how do you, uh, set yourself up to to learn about that i think it all starts with a goal i need something that i'm trying to achieve out of learning this new thing because if i'm just trying to learn it to learn it i'm not going to get as much out of it because when i'm reading the docs and going through the exercises i don't have an end game in mind so my yeah. learning process really usually starts out with i either have a problem or i have a goal and my learning is directed at solving that problem or achieving that goal. So for instance, the Raspberry Pi thing, I wanna know more about how to set up a Raspberry Pi and my end goal is to have Pixie bootable Raspberry Pis that are using USB thumb drives as storage in my lab network and have that automatically install a Kubernetes cluster. That's a lot wow. of things I wanted to do. <laughs> So I have to take off bite-sized chunks and pieces and, and sort of figure out how to get there. But knowing that I have that goal drives me forward in the things that I'm going to learn about. Yeah, definitely. And the, yeah, the Raspberry Pi, I've been playing with those for years. And uh, that project still sounds very daunting to me. <laughs> like, wow. But I mean, that's that's what we all dream about, right? With the lab is like to be able to spin up 10 million servers and do crazy stuff and so the, the pie kind of seems like it's it's going in that direction like we'll be able to do yeah. that someday you could even put windows on them now so that's bonkers i, yeah. I gotta try that <laughs> it is it is bonkers it's not windows server i don't think anybody's got windows server on there but that would be cool so. yeah so do you have any projects you're working on right now or anything you could tell us about uh, the one project that I'm currently working on that I can talk about is I'm working on writing a certification guide for HashiCorp Vault. They have an associate level certification right now. I already wrote a certification guide for Terraform for that associate level cert. That guide has been doing fairly well. And so I'm repeating that same process, but for HashiCorp Vault, I gained a lot of experience with it building courses for Pluralsight and then just through discussions and deployments with other people. 
And because the certification is out there and people seem like they're interested, I thought, hey, why not put together a, a nice guide for it? So that's it's available on LeanPub right now, but it's not finished. I've, I've written two out of the 10 objectives, but I'm going to be, you know, furiously writing every week to try to get it finished. Nice. Yeah, I, I like the LeanPub model. I've I've purchased lean pug books with like three chapters in them before. Yep. <laughs> it's like, it's a cool model. Yeah. Uh, I've already had like five sales. So like I'm on the hook to those five people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will, I will get it done. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. Yeah. Thank you so very much for cool. having me. Thanks, Jeremy and Ned. I, I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed hearing Ned's take on the the subtle differences in your skill sets when you start working remotely. It's definitely been an experience for all of us this year. If you'd like some help keeping your skills and your knowledge fresh, check out more of our all hands on tech interviews on the live platform. Now, earlier, I mentioned our interactive games like Google Cloud Hero and AWS Deep Racer, and we hope that those who are participating are ready to put your skills to the test. Make sure not to miss the kickoff sessions for both games happening today and check back on social at the end of live to see how you stacked up against your peers. We have Cloud Hero games happening in every time zone and Deep Racer kicks off today and runs through the 16th. Now, I'd like to get a quick read on what our viewers are saying. Helping me wrangle our hashtag commentary is our manager, or por uh, manager of portfolio marketing, Sapphire Reels. Hey, Sapphire. What's the word? Hey, Don, so good to see you. There's lots of awesome stuff happening on social, and we'd love to hear more about what you think. We encourage you to use hashtag PSLive20 to share your reactions and connect with other live attendees. And here's another reason to join in. We're running some fun, awesome contests throughout the conference where you can win exclusive Slack. So watch out for that. You'll save me some swag? Of course I will. OK, awesome. <laughs> thank you, Sapphire. We'll check back with you in a bit. Great, thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Dylan Beatty. Dylan is a Microsoft MVP and the creator of Rockstar, a programming language that started off as a joke, but wound up being very real and has been featured in Classic Rock magazine. Dylan speaks at conferences all over the world, and he's joining us today to chat about why everyone should love legacy code. And I know what you're thinking. Let's hear from him now. Hey everyone, I'd say good morning, uh, but I'm recording this in advance. I think it's being shown three times over the course of the conference, and I have no idea what time zone you're tuning in from. So let's just go with a nice relaxed hello. But it's great to be here, even virtually, and I hope you're all having an amazing time so far. My name is Dylan Beatty, and uh, over the course of my career, I've worn a lot of hats, uh, one of which is actually a hat. I've worked as a developer, as a tech lead, a systems architect, CTO. Uh, now I run my own online training business, uh, Ursatile. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I run a .NET user group in London, where I'm recording this from. Uh, I also invented a programming language. Uh, you know all those adverts on LinkedIn and IT jobs about looking for rockstar developers and rockstar programmers? Uh, well, some folks figured, hey, why don't we just make a programming language called Rockstar, and then everyone can be a rockstar developer. And that's what I did, and you can check that out. That is a real thing. It's at codewithrockstar.com. But I'm not here today to talk about esoteric programming languages. I'm here to talk about education. Now, believe it or not, I am a qualified scientist. I spent three years at Southampton University studying computer science, uh, data structures, algorithms, compiler engineering, database theory, all these kinds of things, You know, building programs in Scheme and Prolog and Java. And uh, I was at university uh, right around the time of the dot-com boom. You know, if you remember the, the late 90s when you could get a six-figure salary just for knowing a bit of HTML, yeah, that stopped just before I graduated. Um, but when I got out of university, I got a job with a web agency. And this is back in 2000 when everyone was talking about e-commerce. E-commerce was the next big thing. Uh, and all that stuff I'd learned at university, C++ and data structures and sort algorithms, uh -uh. Nope, didn't use any of it. VB script, stored procedures, HTML. That's where it's at. That's where the money was at. And the really interesting thing about doing web dev way back in 2000 is that we were building websites for companies who'd never had a website before. If you'd never had a website before, 
you know, stands to reason you don't know very much about managing websites, migrating them, supporting them, maintaining them, all these kinds of things. Uh, customers would come to us with a problem, we'd solve the problem, they'd pay us, and we'd go away. And everyone thought that was just kind of how it was going to work. Then one of my colleagues, uh, we'll call him Mike, uh, Mike decides that he's bored of programming and he's going to quit and he's going to become a postman. And a boss comes to me one day and he says, hey, can you look after Mike's projects after he's gone? Of course I could. I'm a professional developer. I have a degree. How hard can it be? Oh, my friends, let me tell you a tale. I'm 20 years old. I've been programming computers since I was eight. You know, I have a degree. I think I know what I'm doing. Nothing in my career has ever prepared me for what happened next. Because suddenly, I was responsible for something like 20,000 lines of VB script and SQL stored procedures that I'd never seen before. You know, anything broke, I had to fix it. Anything needed changing, I had to change it. Now, up until this point, no one except Mike had any, ever worked on any of this stuff. And Mike was good at what he did, you know, he was a good developer, but we didn't have revision control. We didn't have unit tests. There was no specification, coding standards, nothing like that. It's 20,000 lines of VB script stored procedures. I had taken my first steps into the murky world of legacy code. It is a truth universally acknowledged that there are three kinds of code in the world. There is type one code. Type one code is perfect. Fast, secure, readable, elegant. Code so good that actual poets look at it and give up because they know they'll never produce anything that beautiful. Type one code is the code you are going to write tomorrow. It's the code you're going to write next week. When you do your new project on that new framework you've been learning, it's going to be 100% type 1 code. Then there is type 2 code. Type 2 code is the code you wrote yesterday, the code you wrote last week. It's pretty good. Sometimes it gets pretty close to being type 1 code. Just, you know, there's a couple of shortcuts, some rough edges. You need to refactor that method and move those hard-coded variables out into the config file. You know the kind of thing. And then there is type 3 code. Type 3 code is all other code, and it is burning garbage. You can poke around a little bit and sort of maybe make some changes to it, but you have no idea what's going to happen. Really, you need to throw the whole thing away and, and get on with rewriting it as quickly as you can. And the thing is, type 1 code exists only in theory. Type 2 code only exists for a couple of weeks. Type 3 code lasts forever. And not only that, but all code is type 3 code, because you can take any code, any project, any method anywhere on this planet, and you will be able to find a few million developers who will look at it and go, well, I didn't write it, and I don't understand it, so it can't be any good. I want to hang on to that for a second. Let's break that down. I didn't write it, and I don't understand it, so it can't be any good. Because there's two really important assumptions, implications in there. First of all, Code we don't understand is bad. And yeah, you know, I'm going to go with that. If you are responsible for maintaining, securing, optimizing something, and you don't know how it works, that's a scary place to be. Especially if you've got the boss breathing down your neck to, to get stuff done. But there's also this assumption that maintaining our own code is fine, because we know how that works. But maintaining somebody else's code, that's the bit that's scary. And, you know, actually, there's, I think, a lot of truth in that. Do you ever have those days where you wake up and you're excited and you make a cup of coffee and you sit down at your desk because today you're going to write code. Today is a get in it day and then a new project day and it's going to be beautiful. It's the most exciting day there is because it's a type one code kind of a day. And then there are the days when you're like, oh, OK, well, I guess I better start figuring out how this thing works. And so you clone the legacy project repo and you go digging through it and maybe you use something like C lock to count the lines of code that you've got in there, and you're like, okay, 6,000 text files, where do I begin with this thing? Oh, PHP, JavaScript, all right. And those kinds of days, they aren't quite so exciting, are they? Now, uh, Jessica Kerr, Jessitron, has a great talk and essays and stuff that, that she's written on this subject. And uh, I saw a talk that she did where she was talking about something called downhill invention and uphill analysis. And she describes it beautifully. It is easier to build a system from scratch, constructing the mental model as you go along, than to form an understanding of how an already built system works. And 
you know, I'm sure that's also something we can all relate to. That feeling when you've built the whole system from nothing, you understand the views, the behavior, the logic. When that happens, often for me, I'm happy, I'm productive, I'm solving a lot of things and delivering a lot of features quickly. It can be almost intoxicating, you know, that, that feeling, that sense of building things. Um, but there is another side to this as well, which is we don't really get taught how to read, how to study, how to analyze code bases. Now, in the course of my own career, you know, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people from all kinds of backgrounds. I've done, you know, my own degree and stuff. And one of the things I'm always interested in is, did anyone ever teach you how to read code? And it turns out, no. Every programming course ever, uh -uh. We don't study existing code bases. We're going to write lots of little programs. You know, when I was a kid, I wrote little programs and hobbies and puzzles and things. Uh, when I went to university, I spent three years writing little programs because a university degree has to be modular, has to be broken down for semesters and different professors and you know elective subjects and stuff. And so the kind of upper limit on it is a project that one person can turn around themselves in a couple of weeks while they're also working on on all of these other things. I've talked about this before, something that I call the shed problem. It's like you got to study building and the first year they teach you how to build wooden sheds. And then the second year they teach you how to build metal sheds. And then the third year they teach you how to build glass sheds. This is the advanced stuff. And so you then get out into industry and the first really big project that you look at, you're like, hey, I know how to do this. But all anyone's ever taught you to do is to stack sheds on top of one another. Now, when I was putting together the material for this talk, it struck me that, you know, 2000, when I graduated, that's actually quite a long time ago now, uh, which is weird because for anybody who was alive in the last century, 2000 AD sounds unbelievably futuristic still, uh, but actually 2000 AD was 20 years ago. It's the year that gave us the, the Nokia 3310 phone. So I reached out to my networks and I spoke to a whole bunch of people who graduated recently, like people who've been at university within the last five years and they're now working as developers. And I learned some pretty interesting things. First of all, almost everyone has had the same experience. You know, university is about building little greenfield projects, very little in the way of collaboration. Uh, you know, a lot of places, like, no, you can't pair program, that would be considered cheating because it's all about individual merit, right? Um, and then you graduate and you go into industry, you start working in, in the development industry and suddenly, bang, you know, here's 100,000 lines of Java. It's your responsibility now. And nobody really appreciates how difficult this is. It is so rare to find an organization that actually understands and accepts the cost of maintaining and managing their own code. Um, but maybe that's not surprising. You know, our profession is still young. Digital computers have been around since World War II. Home computers, maybe 50 years. If you're working on smartphones and apps that use you know, cellular networking and Wi-Fi and all this kind of stuff, the entire ecosystem that you work in is only 12 years old. You know, that's not even old enough to have an account on Facebook. Now, there's been this astonishing cycle of invention and innovation in computing technology within the last few decades. But in human terms, we are still a young, young industry. You know, compared to industries like medicine, law, aviation, construction engineering, you know, they've got decades, centuries, maybe thousands of years head start on us. But those professions are increasingly relying on us to try and get things right, you know, even while we are still trying to figure out so much of this stuff for ourselves. Something else that came through very strongly in a lot of conversations I had, there is a mismatch between the timescales involved in professional development and the timescales involved in academia and legislation. You know, entire JavaScript frameworks will rise and fall in the time that it takes at a university to agree what's going to be on the curriculum for the next semester. And, you know, when it comes to actually getting a job, that's a problem. Students are graduating tens of thousands of pounds in debt and discovering that their three-year university degree didn't actually teach them the skills that recruiters and companies are looking for. That's got to be a real kick in the teeth, you know. And it raises the question, you know, should we even be expecting developers to have a, a software-related university degree? Now, when it comes to developer education, I think we still don't really understand what we're optimizing for. Uh, aviation, law, medicine, you know, those kinds of fields, if you haven't passed the exams, you're not allowed to go to work. But we recruit developers based on whatever process we decided to use today. 
whiteboard interviews, eh, maybe a GitHub code screen, count the little green tiles, like their profile on Twitter, make them do a coding test, you know. Um, all of these things have happened in, in industry in the last few years. And for somebody out there right now trying to figure out how do I become a professional software developer, we're kind of asking them to get good at three completely separate sets of things. You know, first of all, there's the core skills, the things that are going to stand them in good stead on whatever projects and companies and problems they work on. And part of this is about the fundamentals of software, you know, revision control, database design, compilers, testing strategies, those kinds of things. But a big chunk of it as well is just communication, prioritization, time management, the things we talk about as soft skills, even though they're actually really, really hard. Second, there's the stuff that companies like to ask in interviews, you know, how to pass a coding test, how to pass a whiteboard exam. Now, thankfully, it seems like the days of having to implement shell sort on a whiteboard in an interview are declining. But we still ask candidates to do stuff in interviews and exams that really don't reflect what it's like to work as a professional developer. And then there's the stuff that you actually need to know to do the job. And in most organizations, we got to accept the fact that that isn't anything you can learn at university or at a boot camp or watching Pluralsight videos, because that's about understanding the code and the systems that already exist within that organization. And there's a lot more to legacy code than just code. When you first start working on a legacy code base, it feels like you know an archaeological dig. You're, you're unearthing these little fragments that don't disconnected pieces that don't actually make a huge amount of sense. And you keep digging and you keep digging and eventually pieces start to fit together and you start to figure out how the whole thing works. Um, you know, code can give you a window into a business's history, process, culture. It's like Conway's law in reverse. You look at the way the code is organized, it'll show you how the company is organized and how that's changed over time. Now, Interestingly, many of the technologies that have been developed for use in archaeology are now also used in construction engineering, you know, civil engineering, structural engineering, not just to uh, research abandoned buildings and ruins and stuff, but to maintain and to preserve buildings that we are still using. And there's also this weird overlap between construction and software because we steal a lot of that terminology, right? Architects and scaffolding and pipelines and, and build processes and all this kind of stuff. Um, but they're a lot older than we are. Construction engineering goes back thousands of years. And along the way, that industry has accepted and acknowledged that a huge part of what they do is maintaining a legacy of infrastructure that is vital to the way our society operates. And by accepting that responsibility, we can completely kind of reframe the conversation around what's involved. Now, one of the reasons I'm interested in analogies between software and construction is that my dad, who's retired now, he was a structural engineer for almost his entire life. Uh, this is us when I was a junior developer. Um, and dad worked with people throughout his career, you know, professional, qualified, respected engineers who never worked on a new building. Their expertise was about maintenance and inspection, helping us look after all the things that we already had, bridges and airports, offices, hospitals. You think you found that bug in your legacy code base? You think that was a big deal? Imagine you get a phone call from someone saying there's a crack just appeared in the spire of their cathedral. 16,000 tons of stone, 600 years old, no drawings, blueprints, no specs, just this massive project that was working until suddenly one day it wasn't. And when it happens to buildings, there's people who know what to do about it. And generally, they don't recommend that we tear the whole thing down and rebuild it in JavaScript. And you know, maybe it's time we started following their example. We stopped complaining about how awful legacy code is and start accepting that that's what it really is. It is infrastructure that is vital to how our society is operating. Now, here's an idea. What if the thing that's actually missing from our industry isn't more code and more coders. What if it is a different kind of expertise? We use coding, the act of writing code to solve a problem, as a kind of gatekeeping in all sorts of ways. You know, to get my degree, I had to write lots of little programs. Some of them I got to write on an actual computer in a lab. Um, a lot of them I had to write in an exam hall with a pen. To get my final year grade, I had to write a pub sub engine and a message queue in Java from memory in 90 minutes using a pen and paper. And you know, 
as unbelievable as that sounds, and as much as it pains me to admit it, throughout my career, I've expected other people to jump through those same kind of hoops. You know, every time I've been recruiting developers for the teams that I've managed, uh, there's been coding tests. Write FizzBuzz in C Sharp, implement Conway's Game of Life, build a database for your film collection, create an algorithm, write, implement, build, code, create. Every pathway, every route into our industry involves writing little programs to prove that you know what you're doing. But our industry is not about little programs, you know. It's about big, complicated, important ones. It's about migrations and integrations. It's about fixing security flaws, improving performance. Uh, reducing energy consumption is going to be a massive deal in the years to come for our industry. And such a huge part of that is about understanding. It's about helping developers and organizations understand what they've already got. And I think that there are two massive opportunities here to do things better. First, I think there's a huge opportunity around tooling. Do you remember life before Google Maps? You know, 20, 25 years ago, if you're going to an interview, uh, you'd have to look up the address and then look up the street and then find the page and then figure out how to get there. Um, and if you visited an unfamiliar city, you were absolutely relying on guidebooks, street maps, and road signs, and you spent a lot of time just wandering around being lost. And these days, when you arrive somewhere unfamiliar, which admittedly hasn't happened that much in the, the last few months, um, you get your phone out your pocket and you open a mapping app and boom, there you are. Let's you know, zoom right out. There we are. Look, there's planet Earth. Zoom right in. There's me. Let's search for the place that I want to go. There it is. I can find it. I can zoom in out. I can find coffee. I can find pharmacies. I can switch on a layer that shows me live traffic and I can see which roads are busy right now. You know, that's almost unbelievable. We kind of take it for granted. It's just a thing that works now. Now, when I start working on an unfamiliar code base today, it feels like traveling used to back in the 1990s. I don't know where anything is. Nothing makes sense. I'm not familiar with the cultures and the idioms and the things that folks use to get around here. And even good projects, you know, projects that are uh, well documented with good naming conventions, that just feels like visiting a place where you've got a good guidebook and a good street map, you know? So maybe there's an opportunity. Imagine something like Google Maps or Apple Maps for code bases. Something that lets you zoom right out and see how a code base fits into the world. There's the websites, there's the public APIs, there's the mobile apps. Let's zoom way in under you know, components, containers, individual lines of code, add live traffic. Where are the hotspots? Highlight all the exceptions. Show me the backlogs in the message queues and make them flash in red. You know. Imagine that existed, and now imagine how our attitudes to legacy code might change if we had access to that kind of tooling. And second, I think there is an opportunity to change the way that we teach people to... Now, this is kind of hard, because the phrase that springs to mind is teach people to code, but that's the whole problem. We've been equating software expertise with coding ability for so long that we don't even really have the terminology to describe qualified professionals working in software who aren't developers. Imagine somebody who, as a teenager, they're massively into computer games, and they start studying games to find out how they work. They have no idea, no interest in writing games. They don't want to become a games developer. They want to understand what makes games tick and how all of those different routines and modules and architectures fit together. Imagine a degree program built around that person. So they, instead of flunking their first semester because they can't reverse a linked list in C++, they spend three years using tools we haven't invented yet to study sizable code bases, significant code bases, you know. Not everybody who studies Shakespeare does it. In fact, most people who study Shakespeare do not do it because they want to write plays. People who study military history don't, well, I think maybe some of them do it because they'd like to invade a country and see what happens, but most of them don't. They read, they write, they talk, they analyze, and some of them end up working in software advising folks like us on how to do our jobs better, whether that's you know a technical advisor on military simulation games or business strategy and planning tools and these kinds of things. Because we have precedent for collaborating with people who are experts who are not programmers. Maybe it's time for us to admit that being good at writing code 
is not necessarily the same as being good at reading it. You know, sure, we need people who can solve problems and design architectures and create algorithms, but we also need people who can help us make sense of what we've already got. Um, people who can help us and our organizations understand the capabilities, costs, risks of the systems that already exist. Now, one of the most positive things that I've seen over the course of my own career as a developer is the way our industry embraces technology when it comes to talking to each other, from mailing lists and bulletin boards to web forums to GitHub to social networks. And I've been amazed this year at the number of events that have managed to transition from being in-person to being online events. And a huge part of that is down to our willingness as individuals to explore and embrace new things. You know, the idea of running a meetup on Zoom seemed pretty silly to me me until we had no choice. So we figured it out. And now there's all kinds of elements of online and virtual events that I think we're going to keep for a long, long time to come. So let's use this amazing technology we've created to help each other get better with this. Let's accept that legacy code is never going away, no matter how many times we rewrite it. Let's accept that we can't solve this on our own. Let's re-examine our assumptions around what it is to be a software expert. Find ways to welcome smart, motivated people into our industry without making them write fizzbuzz on a whiteboard. And let's be realistic about how long it's going to take to make these kinds of changes. There's an old Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Well, 20 years ago, we were all busy making e-commerce websites and getting them to work on Netscape 4 and dial up internet. But you know, a lot's changed since then. We might as well get started now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. Let's move to a conversation that's incredibly important and more timely than ever, diversity and inclusion. Our mission to democratize technology skills means creating a more inclusive, safe, and diverse community of technology professionals. I know you're gonna get so much out of hearing from experts in this area who can help us all understand what we can do better when it comes to creating a tech space and a world that's more inclusive. Welcome. We have a wonderful topic today. It's, it's one that's near and dear to our hearts as well as, you know, the hearts of many others. And that topic is equity in the workplace. And I'm joined by a wonderful panel, uh, Sherelle Dorsey, founder and CEO, The Plug, Valerie Williams, founder and managing partner of Converge Firm, and Jeff Henry, founder of Charles Henry Endeavors. Before we begin, I want to just give you all the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Um, how about we start with Sherelle? Awesome. Thank you so much, Angie, for having us here to have this very important conversation um, on all things on diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'm really really excited to be sharing the stage with both Jeff and Valerie, whose work I followed for a number of years, as well as yours. Um, again, my name is Cheryl Dorsey. I'm the founder and CEO of The Plug. We are a subscription-based digital news and insights platform covering the Black innovation economy. Um, a lot of our work is based on data-driven um, insights and work and reporting specific to how the Black innovation economy is shaping up from talent, um, all the way up into startups and funding and sort of how we're moving forward as a country, but more important as a socio-technical society. Hi everyone, so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Again, my name is Valerie Williams. Um, I'm the managing partner of Converge Firm. And what we do is we work with organizations who are embarking upon their diversity, equity and inclusion journeys for the first time. We primarily work with organizations between the size of 50 and 500 employees, and we help them design authentic, stage-appropriate, and data-informed DEI strategies. We want these things to be authentic. We want them to be sustainable, so we help them design those. Uh, we're a boutique firm. Uh, we also host courageous conversations around topics around equity in the workplace. Excited to be here to have this conversation. And I am Jeff Henry. I'm really excited to be on the panel with you know, Sherelle and Valerie and Angie. Great to meet you for the first time. 
Um, I'm the founder of Charles Henry Endeavors, uh, as was said earlier, and that is an umbrella for a number of different business ventures that I have. Um, but right now I focus uh, mostly on um, consulting for early stage companies focusing on tech social justice um, and how those companies can respond to the environment that the world is in right now and how they can be proactive about making the world a better and more equitable place um, for people of color and people from other underrepresented groups. Wonderful. Great. So let's begin the discussion by exploring the current state of the tech industry. Now, when you look across the industry, what do you see in terms of minority representation? And, and let me be very specific here. What do you see in terms of representation of the Black community? Um, I'll, I'll start, and I know Sherelle has all the data, so we can we can definitely dig into it. Um, before I launched Converge, I worked at several tech companies, uh, Google, Airbnb, Stripe, uh, for about six years. And before launching my diversity career, I worked in recruiting. So I was very familiar with sort of the representation of different populations within the tech industry. I think on average, tech companies range 3 to 4% um, in terms of their percentage for Black employees. Um, and uh, that hasn't really changed over time. I mean, I've been working um, in tech now for, for seven years, and that has consistently been the case. Um, Sherelle, is that is that accurate? Is that close to what, where you're seeing on your side? Yeah, yeah. So the representation, although, you know, the African-Americans make, make up, what, 13% of the U.S. population, as an example, um, tech companies are still sitting around three to four percent. So there's a definite underrepresentation within the industry. Absolutely. And I just want to jump in as well, because when we also start to look at the management levels, the directive levels and the C-suites, those numbers completely dwindle with um, many companies, even just for the first time this year, announcing in perhaps their 100 year, 50 year, 20 year history of having a black person for the first time in the C-suite. Um, and even as we continue to look at board seats um, as well, again, those numbers continue to dwindle um, to less than a percent. Yeah. And uh, to add in, um, I've been in Silicon Valley, like proper Silicon Valley. Before that, I worked for a tech company when I was um, in New York at the very beginning of my career, tech giant Apple, and then Airbnb later on. And I didn't really understand the numbers when it came to diversity until I got to Airbnb. Um, and that was about five years ago, as I mentioned. And what I've noticed with representation is that it always is like, and Sherelle has a better grasp on the data than I do, but it's generally underneath 10%. It's usually somewhere between like 0.3% and then all the way up to 10% on an extreme and how those numbers are created um, can be anything from like counting, you know, contract employees and, you know, members of um, like a retail workforce to, to pad them. Um, you know, all the way to, you know, having the legit like actual count of FTEs. Um, but, you know, that being said, doesn't matter. The, the uh, representation has always been sparse. Um, and what's been really disheartening is seeing that, that those numbers haven't really moved um, over the last five years. Um, and I haven't seen any com company make real demonstrable progress towards actually getting representation to where it needs to be within this companies with within these companies with consideration for um, the communities and the demographics that they're trying to get to purchase their products. Um, so maybe that'll lead to another discussion later, but um, overall it's, it's not great. So. Right, right. And with racial tensions in the U.S. being pretty high right now, we're seeing a lot of companies, they're making statements and support of equitable treatment of black people. As much as we demand equity in the workplace, I don't think any of us are naive, right? We realize that it's challenging how uh, systemic this is in these environments. So what are some of the challenges uh, that you see people, some common ones that people are facing when trying to do the right thing and create this equitable workplace? And how can they mitigate those challenges? I, I just want to offer one big one because I keep seeing it over and over and over. We're talking about the process of dismantling racism in a workplace. And I'm talking to you, CEOs, about creating intentional pathways to power and actually moving out of the way and letting your people of color, letting your black people actually tell you what you need, what needs to be done. 
And what I'm seeing often is that white people do not want to give up power. They do not want to give up access. They do not want to do that. Um, it's really, really difficult. It's really difficult for them to really move aside and admit that they do not know the right thing to do in this space. But what I offer to our clients and to, to people that are struggling with this is that you're not going to know what to do. This is not something that you're going to be an expert in. This is not your lived experience. So you have to release the fact that although, yes, you may have grown a business, a billion dollar business or raised all this money, but hey, this is not an area that you understand. So you actually have to like move aside, let your people of color, let your black people within your organization really co-create the path forward. And you need to be a part of it, but not think that you know what needs to be done. And uh, in terms of creating an equitable workplace, the most important thing that any company can do is make sure that you come up off those dollars. And when I say that, I mean to the Black people that work in your organization, to the Black women that work in your organization, to the Black queer people that work in the or your organization, to the Black men, to, to the other countless like pieces of that intersectional demographic, are you really looking at equal pay across the board within your organization as a CEO? Are you making sure that everybody is being paid um, equally to their white counterparts? Because frequently that's that's like not the case. And that's kind of the beginning of where these disparities start. And that's just one piece of it, right? And giving up money is the hardest thing that I've seen any company do, but it's one of the most important things because there's all these compensation philosophies and studies out there saying that basically if your people are paid well, all of the other things will be taken care of. But why would you want to create an extra barrier to your employees that are coming in with all of this extra mental baggage that they have to deal with because of the ways of the world, the way of the world, the world. Um, and it's just the right thing to do. Equal pay for equal work, right? And I, I don't think that I have um, as much more to add here to what Jeff and Valerie have said. Um, I think the only thing that I would interject is that employees are talking to each other and they are talking in what we call these like whisper communities. And so particularly with black employees or employees of color, there are Slack groups, there are group me's, there are these sort of subcultures that exist where information is being shared about your company at the end of the day, because we all have to find out, yes, what kind of salary are you getting? Who's a great manager to work with? What is it like working with the C-suite or getting any, getting any sort of access to the C-suite? These conversations are going on. So just think of them as, a, as, a, as an informal glass door. Um, but this is also going to determine what kind of talent you have coming into your pipeline. Because if people feel that they're being mistreated or oppressed by any, by any stretch of the imagination, you better believe that the networks that they belong to and the talent that you say that you want to start uh, tapping more of is probably already has a red flag on your company saying, oh, wow, you know, I know five or six people that keep saying the same thing about this company culture. And so reputation alone, just in terms of how you are monitoring and ensuring a safe work environment for every underrepresented person um, is, is very, very important. And I think that we have to think, and that, that, that leadership play comes into it, we have to think about what precedent are we setting and not just saying, oh, hey, Black people come work for us, but you can work for us and you won't end up in the bathroom having panic attacks at the same time. So it, it, we have to be very conscientious and very, very thoughtful um, about what is, what is being said. Um, and what experiences are being shared that you as a leader may not be privy to. Great, great stuff. Now, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to uh, really drive it home. Let's say a company comes up with this great plan, right? Um, their heart is in the right place. They want to do the right thing. And they're going to ensure equity in their workplace. As leaders... How should they hold themselves accountable to this? When I, whenever I counsel my clients um, on uh, what you know, they need to do to make sure that they're accountable, um, my perspective is um, all of the reporting is important and is necessary from a trust standpoint, um, as Valerie was mentioning. But more importantly to you as an individual that is in a leadership position that is driving these initiatives, 
Are you using the right language and are you being consistent? When I say language, I think about that as a communications practitioner and expert, right? Um, when you say things, words mean things, right? Your words have power, right? Consistency is also incredibly important. So again, going back to George Floyd, everyone was ready to release a statement. Everyone was ready to release a program. Um, but then look at what's happened in the following two to three months, right? So when we say consistency, it means every time something happens, you're looking into seeing what you can do, right? Anything that it is it has risen to the national stage. Just because it is not about your community does not mean it doesn't affect you or your employees, right? Are you being consistent in how you're talking to people about these issues and how you're responding to these issues publicly? Because the lack of statement, the lack of you know, asking if folks are okay, that silence is deafening and your employees hear it. Your stakeholders hear it. Absolutely. That, that was wonderful, wonderful. Very well said. Well, thank you so much, um, Sherelle, Jeff, Valerie, for sharing your wisdom, your insights, your expertise uh, to the audience. These experts have provided you with excellent ideas on how to get started creating an equitable workspace. Yes, you are behind, but it's not too late to get started and correct those actions. They've also outlined some common mistakes that other companies have made. You're gonna make mistakes too, and that's okay, but hopefully you'll avoid the ones that were mentioned today. So I trust that this has been a valuable conversation for you and uh, you have your homework. You have your homework, all right? Thank you, Sherelle, Jeff, Valerie. Excellent session. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us, Angie. Wow. What an insightful panel. Valerie's comments about not only being willing to move aside a bit, but to really rely on co-creation to create those intentional paths. That was really clear to me, something I, I feel I could act on. At Pluralsight, we don't believe that diversity and inclusion should be a controversial topic. However, we know the world of technology loves a good debate on truly controversial topics like what is the best coding language, Android versus iPhone, or is a hot dog really a sandwich? We want to know where you stand. Check out PluralSiteLive.com to join the conversation and register for our keynote with Simone Yetz. That's up next. And trust me, you will definitely want to get in before the keynote. It is not to be missed. But first, let's stir up a little controversy. Hello, friends. Today I've been asked to tackle the question, is the hot dog a sandwich? And to answer that question succinctly, yes, it absolutely is. But since I know you don't just want to take my word for it, let's go into this topic a little bit deeper, shall we? Let's first talk about the origin of this sandwich, that actual name. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from John Montague, who was the fourth Earl of Sandwich in the 18th century. He loved to play cards. He hated to get his hands dirty, which made him stop playing cards. So what did he do? He sandwiched meat and cheese between two slices of bread and the dish was born. Now, obviously this is not the first time that people have consumed food in this manner, but he got the naming rights and that's now what we're talking about, right? Let me offer you a second origin story, the origin of one Coney Island sandwich or the Frankfurter sandwich, or as you might refer to it today, the hot dog. What? The origin of this dish had a sandwich in the name? Curious. Very curious. I'd like to pose a thought experiment. Imagine in front of you a hot dog prepared however you'd like. Maybe it has relish, maybe some mustard, maybe some onions. It's your choice. Now pluck that hot dog out and replace it with some assorted deli meat, also of your choice. 
That just became a hoagie sandwich. What is it about the presence of the hot dog that removes the sandwich hood of the dish? It doesn't. It's a sandwich before and it's a sandwich after. I'd also briefly like to touch on the naming conventions for popular sandwiches as we enjoy them in the United States. You have the ham sandwich, the peanut butter sandwich, and the grilled cheese sandwich. If you'll notice, there's a pattern here. All three of those examples are named after the primary ingredient that goes between the two slices of bread. Now, following this pattern, I would actually suggest that the proper name for a hot dog is a hot dog sandwich and that that implied sandwich identifier actually is silent on the end of the dish's name. In conclusion, I would actually like to propose a theory. The theory is the existence of this entire debate is one elaborate troll that has somehow paid dividends to those that created it so many years ago. The fact that I'm sitting here talking about it and that you're sitting here listening to it is just payoff for whoever the trolls are that first thought up this question because it's so ridiculous and completely out of the realm of possibilities that a hot dog is not a sandwich. It is case closed. Have a nice day. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> okay, I've, I've changed my mind. A hot dog is a sandwich. <laughs> Sapphire, what do you think? I hadn't really thought about it, but I learned more about hot dogs than I think I've ever wanted to know. Uh, but I'd love to check back in with our community. And so first, I want to give a shout out to Jim Ross, who has showed off his swag and, quite frankly, amazing acrobatic skills on Twitter. Thanks for the many pics that you've all sent in of your kids and your pets in our See Things Differently glasses. And some of you may have already spotted some of our Easter eggs in the background. I'd encourage you to keep sharing those moments those are your favorite moments on our social at P hashtag PSLive20. And if you do, you may have a chance to win the just announced iPhone 12 Pro. Ooh, I'll take mine in green. I'll try to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you, Sapphire. So look, before we hear from our guest keynote, in case you haven't heard, we have unlocked access to every video course on our platform for the entire week. If you've never checked out Pluralsight Skills, now's your chance. And it's also a chance for everyone you know on social media to get in as well. All you have to do is visit pluralsight.com free and you get immediate access to more than 7,000 video courses and more than 300 skill assessments and a whole bunch more. After our general sessions conclude, go check out our breakouts, Google Cloud Hero and AWS DeepRacer Interactive Games. Get your Pluralsight gear at the Swag Store Please donate to the Malala Fund and NRC to support girls' education, and tell us if you're Team Sandwich or Team Hot Dog. There's lots more to experience, so I hope to see you tomorrow for the rest of Plural Sight Live. Okay, we're ready to wrap up the day with our closing keynote. Hi everyone and welcome to our conversation. Today we're going to be talking about building a future for equitable computer science education and I'm really honored to have two incredible leaders with us today from code.org. Um, with me is Jackie Smalls and Leo Ortiz. I'll quickly introduce you to the two of them. You can read more about Jackie and Leo um, on our page in, in the conference website. So Jackie is Code.org's Chief Program Officer. She has a really rich background in STEM education and she has served as the Head of Programs for Black Girls Code and previously run professional learning programs for Discovery Education. Her work has impacted thousands, tens of thousands of teachers and students. She's also served as an environmental scientist in the US Army, which is an incredibly unique uh, role, a school teacher, and one of the standards writers on the next generation science standards. She lives in South Maryland, only a few minutes from DC and Virginia. And Jackie leads the education programs team at code.org. Thank you so much for joining us, Jackie. Thanks, Lindsay.
And Leo, Leo Ortiz is the VP of International Partnerships at Code.org. In his role, he drives partnerships with organizations from all over the globe, including governments, nonprofits, and private entities to scale Code.org's mission uh, by equipping students with the skills they need to really understand this new world and succeed in it. Before joining Code.org, he held various communications, public, public affairs, and corporate social responsibility roles at companies like Microsoft, Edelman PR Worldwide, and the government of Mexico. So thank you both for joining. Leo, welcome. We're so happy to have you, and we're really honored for our partnership. I'm going to do... Great. Uh, I'm going to do a brief summary of our partnership with Code.org. We have a multi-year partnership. Um, our partnership spans three years and we're really eager to deepen and continue that partnership. We, um, we launched together with a focus on improving equity and inclusion in computer science with a special emphasis in our work on improving girls, representation of girls and underrepresented minorities in computer science. That is the work that code.org is expert at. And um, really our intention is just to help you by being a catalyst for that work. We have provided a $1.5 million grant to code.org over three years and our investment is really focused on enabling you all to grow your resources for teachers and students, uh, continue to develop curricula across K-12, and expand your efforts to retrain America's K-12 through teachers. Um, we also are really focused on debunking misconceptions tied to computer science through your Hour of Code efforts, and we've been heavily involved with your advocacy team in efforts to advance CS opportunities to learn. Um, we built a free product with you all that's available to help high school students go beyond what they learn through Code.org's platform, and that is really focused on um, four main areas, IT ops, software development, design creative, and product management. And to together we have scaled that 500 hours of content more broadly, especially in response to the pandemic. And lastly, uh, one of the things that really overlaps with Leo's work, we have supported Code.org's international expansion to translate and localize Code.org's curriculum and content while supporting their offline and mobile functionality. So lots of overlap and, and you know, our intention is really to help you all um, grow. Your, your work is incredible. We want to see you scale around the globe and are really just um, happy and honored to be a partner with you in that work. So Jackie, if you could familiarize our audience with Code.org, I know many are very familiar with the Hour of Code, but if you could take them deeper into Code.org's work, your mission, and your scope of influence, um, and tell us what, what is the status of computer science education today, and why is it not universally accessible? Sure, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And we can't do what we do um, if we didn't have partnerships like ours. So we appreciate all that um, you are doing for us and with us um, to make sure that computer science is really accessible for all students. And that speaks to our mission. At code.org, our vision is that every student in every school should have the opportunity to take a high quality computer science class. Uh, we're not, you know, the name code.org may, may lead you to think that we want all students coding. And that's not the case. We want to make sure that students actually have experience in computer science. We're not expecting that everyone that takes a computer science course becomes a full stack developer or software engineer. However, they, they grow the skills that we know um, by engaging in a computer science course that you build, such as problem solving, critical thinking, because really computer can solve many of the world's issues that we have. And we can go into that a little bit more. But we are trying to push past the hour of code. So it's beyond just the hour of code and that one hour of exposure and excitement of celebrities. Um, we spend most of our time working to make lasting, sustainable, affordable change to the education system. So again, that all schools teach computer science. And we know um, it's disproportionately represented. Um, it impacts underrepresented minorities and groups and poor students and schools in needs. Um, and we wanna break that, break that barrier down and how can we make the 
face of computer science look more diverse and become more diverse. And so um, I could pass it on to Leo to talk about that aspect and the work that we're doing internationally. But again, um, we really appreciate the partnership that we have and what we're trying to do to change the face of technology. Thanks, Jackie. The only thing that I would add is obviously that um, that gap uh, that Jackie was referring to, it also shows when you see the map around the world, which are the countries that have more access to certain resources and have been able to advance computer science in the formal education system and the countries that haven't been able to do that as well. So part of our job is to, to reach out to different governments to figure out how to work with them to drive systemic change and to incorporate computer science in the curriculum. And we can talk a little bit more about the details as we go along. Great, great, thank you. And you, you touched on it, but you know, your work was already hugely complicated and massive in scope before COVID hit. Um, and I think code.org had made incredible headway. You had millions of students learning through Hour of Code and then more deeply through your curriculum and had done all of that work um, you know, with, with local and global entities. And now the pandemic has really exposed more equity gaps in education. So what is the magnitude of need that you're seeing around the world today? And how has that changed in the last few months since the, the crisis really hit? The first thing that I would like to highlight is that the pandemic really showed that almost no education system was fully ready to the sudden shift to online learning. You know, that, that's a reality. I think we can all agree that that was even a reality here in the United States and in other developed countries. So you can just do the math and, and think about what's happening in other places where, where families don't have devices at home, where there's no broadband, et cetera. So that, that's, that's a big problem. Now, if you want to understand the dimension of the issue is there's around 1.7 billion students around the world. At a given moment around March, between like the end of March and early April, 91% of those students were out of school. And so that gives you just an idea of how, of the severity of the school closure around the world. We're still not back uh, everywhere. There's around any, anywhere between 45 and 50% of the schools around the globe are still closed which means that kids are relying on distance learning. And that's still a challenge. Even if all governments have a plan for distance learning, it doesn't mean that the one, like 100% 1 of the student population is accessing. So that's a big, big challenge. And, uh, and, and well, there we've been, we've just been seeing uh, how the different governments are trying to face this. Um, it goes beyond computer science. This is just in general, how to get back on track with education, using technology, and obviously figuring out how the majority of the students can have access and the teachers. That's, that's another challenge as well. Yeah, I think those, those numbers are just staggering. Um, and disruptions to learning are, you, that takes a lot of different shapes. You know, it's everything from what we see around the US today where there may be um, inequitable access to connectivity or maybe no devices at home um, or a lack of parental support in learning online or you know, school districts that aren't equipped to move and support their teachers in that way. I think one of the really troubling things we're seeing that with the 50% number that you mentioned of, of those who are remaining out of school or, or continuing to face disruptions is that many of those kids are at risk of not returning to school after the, the crisis passes. And so not only is there a need for you to support them now and in this interim and continue their learning um, while the, the systems are grappling with a new, a new future of education, but also to make sure that they're able to, to re-enter or they're able to learn in whatever context they, they end up in um, due to the pandemic or after. So anything, you know, we've talked about the importance of the formal education system as sort of an anchor for students and um, a lot of code.org's work is to embed CS in the formal education system. 
Why is that so important to you? And, and how do you do that when the needs are, are changing so quickly and the needs are so variable? Great question. And I can start, Leo. You know, one of the things you may see is that, you know, volunteers are great. We want volunteers, especially we want kids to be able to see what, what's capable or what, you know, the potential to how do you use computer science as it relates to a career. Um, however, we want to make sure that it is a part of formal education and it should be just like math, just like science and reading, because if it is formalized, then it becomes a standard. And right now we know that it's not a standard. We know that there are some states that mandate computer science. We know that others that do not. And that's where we're really trying to do our work. The majority of schools are still not teaching computer science. Only 45% of high schools actually teach or offer computer science. It hurts our economy. It's going to create major inequities in education if we continue to go down this path of, you know, not the majority teaching computer science. And so with that being said, we have to address it on several levels, um, especially around funding and professional learning and staffing within school districts um, and states really providing mandated um, support and funding for computer science. South Carolina will just have the first graduation requirement for computer science. You know, if we could do that across the board, we know that we can make change because then we're, prepare we're preparing students and not just at the high school level. Um, earlier today, I was speaking on a panel and we talked about the importance of having computer science in formal education at the K-5 level. A kindergartner is capable of learning computer science. And for some that they don't believe that, but when we actually see it, um, it's magical to see that kindergartner, you know, come to light when they see that they've created something um, as it relates to uh, computer science. And we think that should be available for every student, not just chosen students based on their zip code, based on the color of their skin, based on their geographical location. Um, it should be an opportunity for all students. And how do you do that? It's through formalized education systems. Um, not to discredit after school activities or programming, but we know sometimes that widens the gap just as much. But if everyone's afforded the opportunity of education, computer science should be part of it. Mm -hmm. And code.org often says that you know, uh, computer science is a new foundational literacy. I think one of the things that's been um, a really important learning in our home state of Utah for Pluralsight is in these conversations with stakeholders, um, I, think, I think there are a lot of different definitions of computer science that exist and there's, um, there's work that together we need to do to really uh, help help the educators, help state leaders understand how computer science is a driver for opportunity, no matter the industry, and how these are skills that uh, really transform students, as you said, Jackie, even kindergartners, from mm -hmm. creators into creators. They are no longer just a consumer of technology, but they can also be a creator of it. And um, I think that that power is really important um, can you speak a little bit more about the mandate? Because I know that, that that tends to be a scary word in some states. So when you say mandate and a, and a graduation requirement, why is that so important to ensuring equity? And what does it change? What's different than that versus having a course that students can opt into? Well, we do have advocacy work that um, we're working on in terms of at least, you know, the 50 states just really being able to adopt policy. And that policy is um, predicated on nine different areas in which we really think it becomes part of, it becomes systematic in K-12 computer science. So when you think of mandate, you're just saying that you're able to provide equity if it's mandated. If it's not, then it becomes a choice. It becomes a choice whether to have computer science or not. And what we're trying to say by mandating is that it becomes part of the norm. And that's what we're pushing for at code.org. So it allows a state or local school district to adopt a vision wrapped around policy and framework so that you have the five principles that we've developed these nine policies that we think is best practice. That means you'll have equity, diversity, clarity even, um, the capacity in which you are able to expand within K-12, 
leadership is part of that. So they understand that it's a, it's a priority and then it becomes sustainable. And we're, we're actually asking not just for mandates because a mandate without funding would be a hardship, right? So the two have to go hand in hand and we know it's possible and we still have long ways to go. But if we are to um, make sure that computer science is equitable, we have to have some foundation and that's what we mean by making something mandated um, and push for that. Leo, did you want to add to that at all? Everything that you just said applies internationally. The only thing that I would say is that we have identified around a little bit over 50 countries in the world that have either already adopted policies and have programs in place to a certain extent or have uh, announced their intention to do some of that. So there's those 50 are in all categories of, of something somewhere between having a formal curriculum or just starting to drive awareness and to try certain CS related programs. Uh, but it's important and then policy is important and then executing that policy through different programs and, and budget allocation uh, and teacher training. That's, right. that's in order to really scale this globally. We're still a long way, uh, still a long way in the U.S. and, and the countries, the most uh, developed countries that have invested in this discipline are also still not at 100%. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of opportunity around the world. Yeah, and, and the subject matter is changing so rapidly. You know, you need to really have fresh content and equip teachers with skills that are really dynamic and can keep pace with the evolution of technology. Uh, what are what are some of the unique barriers that are preventing inclusion for girls uh, and other underrepresented minorities in CS around the world, Leo? We've mentioned that there are some similarities that you see um, to the U.S. We have a global audience here today, so I'd love to just hear you really illuminate the, the global landscape that you're working in and what you think we can learn from some of those countries that are leading out on this. There are various dimensions to that. Uh, obviously, access to content in local language, just in general, is something that immediately excludes large portions of, of different populations. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you could argue that India is a place in which a lot of people speak English, right? Which is true. You could probably deploy programs with English. But when you go through the socioeconomic spectrum, um, that is a reality in certain parts of the pyramid, um, in the upper parts of the pyramid. As you go down, uh, you, they don't speak English, they speak Hindi, and they speak many other languages depending on the region. So if you don't have content that is in local language, you're immediately excluding millions and millions of people. So that's one. Uh, access to connectivity and to devices is another one. Uh, there are obviously different levels of, of connectivity index around the, the globe, but even the most developed countries have issues. The United States has issues when we have like close to 30 million people with no access to broadband, right? And 23% of the or 20, around 20 something million are in rural areas. You go to other countries and it's the same. Rural areas suffer. Um, and you go to continents like Africa and then the access issue is even gr greater. So that's another one. Um, when it comes to creating content that is culturally relevant, uh, that's the other thing. It's like, uh, we actually have a lot of content. Uh, we, we think that our content is rich and that it, it, it can be used everywhere in the world. But then when you get into the particularly those idiosyncrasies of a given place, you may want to localize even further so that the examples that we use, and that's something that the teachers are key. Uh, you know, teacher training and how the teachers teach certain content allows for it to be more relevant for the students. Last but not least, unfortunately, around the globe, forget about CS, just education in general, there is a big gender gap. There are places in which girls are still not allowed to go and, and learn mm -hmm. because of different different issues uh, of society. Um, 
And, and like UNESCO recently, for example, announced that they fear that after the pandemic, there's going to be 11 million uh, young women around the world that will, just won't return to school at all. And our, our partners at Malala Fund just did an additional research study on that based on the Ebola crisis and estimated that that number could be as high as 20 million because of the protracted nature of the shock. And that's, you know, girls who are subject to early marriage or who are out of school because the family has taken an economic hit and can't afford to send all kids to school. Many, many reasons. But, you know, I think the complexity, the complexity is um is really overwhelming the magnitude of the crisis is incredible and uh also the velocity at which needs are changing is really um something to be keen keenly aware of so i think one of the things that's so amazing about code.org is i think you are already really well positioned to um, to adapt to the situation. You have been at the forefront of this work. You've been integrating computer science as a foundational literacy and supporting these different systems that can be available offline and mobile, um, can be inclusive in the way they're designed. And, you know, even down to having characters and, and speakers and leaders and, and teacher professional development that really helps teachers be equipped to, um, to recruit students of diverse backgrounds into their classes. So all of that, I think, is really essential work that enables us to prevent backward momentum and, um, and, and keep chipping away at this really massive problem. I was just going to add in, in terms of that, like statistically among women, if those who tried AP computer science um, are 10 times more likely to major in computer science if they continue with it. And so just thinking about, again, it becomes the opportunity. Do they right. have an opportunity to even engage? And I often think of myself. Um, I myself, I, when I started college, I wasn't majoring in a science field. And I always did well in math and I've always did well in science. And in, it, it took until college for someone to say to me, have you ever considered uh, a STEM field or going into the STEM field or majoring in, in a particular science? And I hope that we've moved forward <laughs> to a degree um, with that. And, but we still have a long way to go. But back to what Leo said in terms of cultural responsive um, curriculum, but it's also about pedagogy, how we're teaching it, and inclusion. We have to think about the voices that aren't in the room mm -hmm. and not just representative of what's in the room, but what's not in the room when we're thinking about that curriculum. And I also think about the high quality curriculum and it goes back to mandates. If it's mandated, if it's funded, the chances are having that high quality curriculum could also impact. And also about the recruitment of teachers as we look at who's teaching computer science or we think about who represents computer science, we also have to think about who we're recruiting and how we're also doing professional learning. And as you said, Lindsay, I'm so glad you highlighted it. In terms of our professional development, at the core of our professional development is equity. And how do you attend to that as you're teaching um, computer science in the classroom so it does become inclusive, that it's diverse in terms of having students being able to access the curriculum and they see themselves in right. what they're able to do. So I yep. just wanted to bring those points up too. because Yeah, it, it's such <laughs> a great point. And we've had some really striking, striking moments where you know, that has just played out. Um, one young woman stands to mind. Um, she started learning through code.org on her own and she never knew what she could build with these skills. She didn't know that these skills could help her advance um, a career that was sort of outside a traditional engineer or developer uh, type track. And so I think, you know, when you're talking about teacher professional development, part of it is helping students connect these skills to their dreams and see how these skills are a powerful catalyst for them no matter what industry, whether they're in agriculture or technology or aeronautics or, you know, medicine or the arts, you know, we've had so many 
um, there are, th this is um, a tool that you will need no matter what field you end up in, especially now that the, the future of work is evolving so rapidly and we're becoming, you know, digitized. So um, one of the things that also struck me, uh, Jackie, about what you said is, you know, teachers, teachers are really, uh, they have a role that may not have been what they signed up for. <laughs> they, they have to teach in a new format. They have to teach digitally. They have to engage with students um, through Zoom or whatever it may be. And, um, you know, in this increasingly digital teaching and learning environment, what are, what are they really juggling today? You know, one of the things a teacher, a friend of ours said is, that you know it was never a prerequisite that teachers have connectivity at home and i think that that is a really powerful uh reminder that this is not universal for teachers either um and and trying to find ways for teachers to connect their students and really unlock that excitement and that inspiration in them um and particularly to do that with students who may not see a connection to this topic, you know, it's really hard work. So can you just like take us into a day of a life of, of teachers today and um, how you think the tech industry can better support them? Wow, I think we could have just a forum on that, on that one question alone. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I say this um, in the most authentic way. I was speaking with my cousin who had a call of help out to the family. Uh, she, she's like, I can't get this Google Classroom right. Like, I, I'm trying to help my own kindergartner, and she's a kindergartner teacher. And so um, I dialed her up, and we were trying to figure out, like, how do you download this one particular app or something that she had to interact yeah. with? And so when you say, what are teachers juggling with today? <laughs> are we talking about pandemic and response? Because I think it's just added a greater impact of especially those teachers who are having to shift their practice who are not who weren't necessarily comfortable with technology anyway and now have no other option but to use technology mm -hmm. um, but also trying to support their students which they call their own kids i know as a teacher i used my family used to ask me are you referring to your own kids or are you referring to the kids you teach? Because you, they do become your kids. Mm -hmm. But I think teachers now are, some are being forced to choose of being at home and being able to be present for their own kids that have to er learn online and teach students online. Um, so I think that showed a gap in terms of what was needed in support of teachers using technology. That's one thing that they're juggling, just one. So many. They're they're having to be an IT support line. They're, you know, they're having to create whole new curriculum plans. It's it's massive endeavor. And I think for all of those who are parents and who have empathy for teachers today, um, know that you know many times computer science teachers it's a pretty lonely role. They're, you know, they're leading out on a subject and integrating that into their, di their district or their school or providing that access oftentimes on top of other subjects that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have some teachers who, um, who are, are woodshop teachers or art teachers and are also teaching CS now. So exactly. I just really want um, all of us to demonstrate empathy and um, think about how what we're building, what we're creating could support teachers and um, really encourage and thank them, you know, come to them with a lot of gratitude for what they're overcoming to make sure that students, no matter their, um, their learning styles, their needs are being included in this. Leo, what are you seeing on this internationally? Well, globally, I think the pandemic just forced digital transformation right. for many, many, many different sectors in society. And I think teachers probably in generalizing were a little bit late to the game of, of technology adoption globally. So this pandemic is forcing them to start using tools that they've never used before, but most important to start teaching in a way that they've never done before in general. Some of them are, especially in higher ed, but, but I mean, like in basic like in education, that wasn't the case. I think that the upside that we will see from all of this, even though this has been a tough transition for a lot, 
of teachers that didn't have access, didn't have devices, didn't have the training, is that after this pandemic, to the extent that they get devices, that they do get some training, I think that eventually when we go to the whatever the new normal is going to be, which is not going to be the one that we used to have, they're probably going to be less intimidated in continuing to use technology for their day to day. It may look different than what we're doing right now under the emergency, but, but my, uh, my hope is that teachers are going to be a little bit more familiar with technology and they're going to probably be more open to exploring how to better incorporate technology into how they teach one and even more important into the type of content they teach you know, right. meaning they may be less intimidated to teach computer science or to learn how to teach computer science or if anything they'll see the importance uh, you know a lot of these tools are standard business tools today mm -hmm. and so as you think about what you're preparing your students for this is the this is the world of work you have to be able to jump between six different you know platforms you you have you have you have to be a dynamic technologist uh, no matter your role and so I think um, certainly in our work at Plural Site One, we're seeing a new breed of humanitarians emerge. And I think what you're saying, Leo, is we're seeing a new, um, a new breed of educators emerge also, one that is powered by technology and can harness that as a tool in their toolkit. And I, I love that. I think um, one of the things, like, I'd be curious to know, how is, how is code.org um, sort of leveraging that momentum, that opportunity for change and that openness, that need among teachers to, to build momentum for computer science and um, really help to integrate this into the core. Sure, uh, well, one thing is that we have learned lots from what we had to shift and pivot as the word has become of the year pivots. Um, in terms of what we thought we'd be able to do in workshops. So our summer workshops, you know, is one of our hallmarks in terms of professional learning. And we thought that we wouldn't be able to reach as many teachers that we would want to reach. But we went from on-site training to developing an on-virtual um, platform within a month and a half. Wow. And, <laughs> and giving um, teachers that opportunity to learn in that environment and being able to adapt it and to model some of the best practices that you would for virtual learning. And so we, um, it forced us to look at things differently and the possibilities of how learning could take place in a virtual environment. So um, a lot of positive things are coming out of this as well and new skill sets. Um, and so that's just one area. The other areas that are in terms of our curriculum, which was really built to be um, in school to interact, to collaborate um, amongst students, to build community within the classroom, we had to look at our curriculum and how could we make adjustments and modifications for it. So we know that there's three different ways now that students are learning based on the impact of COVID. Either they're on-site social distancing in classrooms, um, they're learning virtually, or they have a hybrid. And what we've done is take all of our lessons and we've created modifications to adapt to those three different modalities and try to support and empower teachers to be able to do so and still continue to teach computer science even if the environment hasn't changed. So it's forced us to do that as well and learn from it. And I think it's only made us more powerful in terms of how you could also continue to teach computer science through different ways. Um, and teachers still, we were still able to train over 3000 teachers this summer given the virtual environment. We thought we would do half of that, <laughs> um, but we exceeded it. And so just learning how to now, like we all just talked about, this new environment um, has really changed the possibilities of what we're able to do and how far we can reach. That's one other thing I just note, like in the past, having on-site um, professional learning prevented a barrier for some teachers. They couldn't get to our professional learning, but virtually right. you can stay connected. And we're finding that, you have more of a community virtually. 
because you're not just leaving a site, waving goodbye to a teacher that you may have met. Our computer science community has even grown because those virtual connections continue even after, say, a professional learning or cohort has been established. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, you know, really a great testament to your, your inclusion goals, too. I think it creates more inclusion for those teachers, and uh, it also creates a more diverse community of practice for them breaks down some of those barriers that you were mentioning. Um, one of the, shifting gears a little bit, one of the, the misconceptions we often see in the tech industry is that, you know, we see all of this um, pathways work happening, connecting K-12 education to, to employment. And there tends to be an assumption that that path is linear. And, um, and that path, especially for students whose learning has been disrupted or who may, uh, may not have a traditional path to employment, is often not linear. Um, so, you know, I think it's really interesting to think about the work that you're doing to promote computer science down in K through five so that those students have progressive learning opportunities all the way through. And by the time they, they graduate, they have more sophisticated skills. They have more workforce readiness. They, they see the different skill sets and where they could apply those skills across roles, across industries. And I think that's one of the real opportunities that we have in, um, in the tech sector to really bring those roles and those opportunities to life for students so that they can think about what type of career they might want to perform pursue and what type of skills they might need to get there. So I'm curious, you know, especially Leo for you, um, when you have so many students whose learning has been disrupted or economies are in peril and uh, the opportunities may not be abundant, they may not be clear paths for students, what, what do you see happening? Do you see more students becoming entrepreneurial, creating their own, their own opportunities through CS, or, or do you see them going into different industries or pursuing virtual work? Like, what, what's happening when um, a traditional path from education to employment breaks down? There's a mix of that, but let me just come back to you in a comment uh, about the IT industry or the technology industry. I think this is not exclusive to the tech industry. And, and I think that's something that needs to be clear. All of these skills that, that people learning computer science will get are gonna be useful for all industries and for all roles. Probably a little bit less evident right now than what we may see in 10 or 15 or 20 years. But if you just try to understand what's happening in the, this future of work, and that, which I don't think is just the future, it's the present already. Like McKinsey Institute uh, tracks this and they have assessed that right now with the technology that exists out there in the marketplace, there is a potential for 50%, five of 50% of all jobs right now in the world to be able to be automized. So automated. Yeah. So you imagine that, it doesn't mean that it will happen, but it just means that with the existing technology, if employers wanted, that they could automate 50% of the jobs. That means that there will be a lot of jobs, especially manual labor, that will disappear. And there will be new jobs. The problem is that the people that will be out of jobs don't have the skills for the new jobs. So right now, that is, there is a sense of urgency out there from the private sector to go especially into secondary education to try to equip uh, kids around the, the high school age train to be ready for the workplace. Mm -hmm. The problem with that approach is that you will never solve the pipeline because right. you, will, you will always be working at the last mile of, of the pipeline. That's why for us, it's super important to start since kindergarten and to start just putting out all those skills so that kids can learn and they can then apply in whatever industry they're in. I may not have responded to your question. No, no, I think it's great. And thank you for clarifying that. I completely agree. And I think, you know, that, that formative learning is really important to create a lifelong learner and an adaptable learner too. We see so many boot camp type efforts that are rapidly reskilling those who have been unemployed, who have dropped out employment, need to transition between sectors 
or students in their junior, senior year and quickly scale them up for a position. And my fear is that it's not, uh, it's not preparing them to grow in roles and to have agency, but it is, it's, it's sort of equipping them to do a quick job. Um, and that job doesn't prepare them for growth, doesn't prepare them um, to really deepen, deepen their career. So um, I think what you all are doing in the early years is so important. Of course, we need to do both now. Um, and there's urgency across the board, <laughs> but um, I, really, I really appreciate and value the work that you're doing with young children too. Lindsay, I was just going to say, one thing that we just announced is that we have 100 million projects that we've reached in terms of students creating. So I think that also speaks at a younger age for a student to see that not only they can use an app, but they can actually create one. <laughs> not only are they playing a game, but they actually can create one at such an early age, will just shows them the possibilities of what they're able to do. And like you said, to become their own creators of content rather than consumers. And putting that in their mind and planting it at such an early age at K-5, it does build that foundational course that we talked about our you know, platform for students to grow to that. I would also say that we also need to look at the supports that exist from K-12 to secondary. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the pipeline, um, and that's another issue that I, I probably could say things that might be a little controversial, so I won't, because uh, <laughs> we sometimes hear that there's the lack of diversity in the pipeline. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think right. that there needs to be more support in terms of mentorships, internships, uh, you know, apprenticeships, because you have those that are not necessarily always represented having the same supports that those that are. And so they tend to not continue and because it gets challenging and difficult, but we know that and we've seen that when you have extra support, you might stay the course in terms of really entering into the computer science field. But again, like if you're just given those skills and opportunities and see what you actually can create on your own, I think is just more motivational to continue with computer science and just have those developed skills. Right, and we do see that, I mean, code.org has a, has a graphic that shows that the diversity problem in K through five persists all the way on through secondary education into uh, vocational training or higher ed and into the workforce. So if we aren't really um, attacking this problem at the root, we will continue to see that problem persist. And, you know, I think a lot of it comes back to that that um, inclusive teaching practices, how do you connect students of all different backgrounds, all different types of students to these, uh, to what can be created through computer science and help them see um, their connection to this subject and debunk some of the myths that may exist about what CS is and how relevant it is to their life. Um, so Leo, I, there's this perennial problem of scaling technology responsibly and doing that in a cost-effective way that meets the volume of need while also maintaining protection and dignity at the core of interactions. And I'm curious, what are you seeing as, as effective practices to do this as this sort of new world of um, tech-enabled education takes shape internationally? Um, what are some of the risks and, and what are some of your recommendations there? Yeah, there's a great need for offline assets. You mentioned it earlier. There's a great need for uh, assets and technology and content that works with mobile devices. It's, uh, it's very hard to create something that is like a one size fits all because the world is not like that. Uh, and there are like different ways of learning and the different technology that the adoption in, in, in various places. So I think that ultimately organizations like ours, we need to explore several avenues. We need to have different offerings and we're working on that. You know, we are still far from having everything that we think that we need to have. But, but offline is a very important thing. Let me tell you a, a, an example. I recently went to, uh, before we stopped traveling, uh, I, I, one of my last trips actually, um, that my last international trip this year was to El Salvador uh, because the government of El Salvador is really trying to 
to adopt computer science into their curriculum, but we were visiting schools in different parts of the country. The, the country is small, you can just drive through it in six hours, mm -hmm. yet it's still, you have urban areas, rural areas, places where even if the, one, the government wanted to invest in a lab, a PC lab, there's no broadband in that town, right? So there's, there's no commercial option there to get broadband. So the government is deploying, and this is a common thing in many countries, by the way, they deploy computer labs with a server that preloads all the content so that the, the kids in that school can go into the computer lab, all those individual terminals are connected to the server and the server is providing all the content, so, something that you would normally access online. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do more of that. And that's, that's a solution that we're currently working on to put not just a few tutorials and a few lessons, which is what we currently have uh, through the support of organizations like yours, but now we're doing something larger mm -hmm. in which we're gonna make our full platform offline eventually. Uh, so yeah. that's, but that's, that's a huge undertaking as well. So that's, that's something that we need to do and many other providers need to do. Yeah, and anyone listening to the call who wants to support that work, I would encourage them to get in touch with code.org. Uh, and, and I often receive this question, you know, well, what's, what's the value in teaching these skills if, if kids don't have access to connectivity uh, or a computer lab and the ability to practice these skills or apply these skills? And what I've found is those skills unlock this level of ingenuity and creative um, problem solving that is localized and is incredibly powerful. I was in northern Uganda last year and there was a young refugee boy um, who had watched courses online and are offline, courses that were available online that had been made offline. And um, he had learned how to make a Wi-Fi booster and he made it out of plywood and uh, chicken wire and boosted Wi-Fi all across the refugee camp setting, which was creating the opportunity for families to reconnect with their loved ones after they'd been forced to flee from conflict. So really incredible local in ingenuity that is powered by the skills that can be learned and can solve problems that are standing in the way of scaled education and access. Uh, I'm sure you've seen many of those. I, I saw another young um, student who had learned through a similar innovation hub with offline content and built a solar charger so that he could charge phones and make money, small amounts of money as a mobile mobile phone charger. So the economic opportunity comes out of that. You know, there's a ton of really interesting community resilience that I think is built on uh, when these skills are able to saturate communities that have been really um, isolated from them because of connectivity issues. So really grateful for the work you're doing to take that offline. <laughs> let, me, let me add one thing, Lindsay. The, not all the lessons require connectivity. There are unplugged lessons as well. We actually yeah. have like more than 50, around 50 unplugged lessons in which kids, and actually at the younger age, it is recommended that you learn first not in a computer. Mm -hmm. You just learn with, with uh, colors and things and objects because the most basic concepts for computer science can be taught in an unplugged way, like yeah. how an algorithm works and you, and you do it unplugged. That's a great reminder. And you do have resources for parents as well on your website that are unplugged, right? Yes. Good. Okay, so we're, we're almost at time here. Just maybe two more questions. So um, Jackie and Leo, what are some requests or calls to action for our community, our audience here today? How can they apply their skills to help you address the need? And how can they keep a pulse on the situation as it changes? Well, I would say just in, you described some of it in terms of the partnership and what we're doing, like just having the ability to have the awareness, like amplifying the awareness of the importance of computer science. Um, and that's in speaking and you know, advocating for the importance of computer science at the earliest level, um, I think is one way. Um, also just volunteering, volunteering, the need for not just the physical, you don't always have to be physically um, present to volunteer, but just in terms of 
tech strategy um, in terms of how do we think or what, what are you looking for in terms of an organization or a tech industry or company that you need skills for? And so how can we make sure that we dial that back in terms of what we're trying to build in, in our curriculum and the skills that students need to learn so they could be someone that you'd want to employ um, after they finish their their time in K-12 because they might not go post-secondary. Um, so there's various different ways that I think that organizations could support um, and really collaborate, like really build and be part of the coalition that is part of this movement to ensure that computer science is accessible for all students. Mm -hmm. And sharing their own experience as a, as a learner or as a technologist or someone who has found value in CS. I think also trying to wrap around teachers today is really important. You know, we've, we've done um, some mentorships of teachers, helping them become more equipped to, te to teach um, or utilize technology, even doing troubleshooting support for teachers who are having to do all of that IT support for their students across devices and different contexts. So Leo, anything you'd add, any, any calls to action? All of the above, but also for people that have skills, in language skills and, um, and technology skills, we can always use more help to translate. There's, there's just tons and tons of, of content that we need to translate. And we're investing more and more into professional translations for many top languages. But the amount of languages in the world is such that it's never enough. So anyone who can... Who, and, and, and we can make it very easy in, in bite-sized projects so that people can come and spend a couple of hours translating something small and that accrues to something that is larger and impactful. Love it, love it. And, and to do that, they would just contact code.org through the links on your website? Yes. Okay, uh, so lastly, if, you, if either of you could wave a magic wand, what would you do to realize Code.org's mission and ensure that every individual can realize their right to education and the opportunity to learn CS? Oh, that's, I'm going to pass it to Leo because that's <laughs> a loaded question and we only have a couple minutes left. Well, at the Uber level is just ensuring that it's in the school in the same way as math and language and, uh, and science. Like if, if we were there around the world, and I, of course for that to happen, there's a lot of other things that need to happen. Sure. But that's the ultimate goal. So I would just say, I, I wanna make sure that we're already in the schools everywhere in the world. And right. by, uh, that we, I mean, not just code.org, I mean computer science. Sure. Uh, with whatever platform, whatever curriculum, but that computer science, it's already in the curriculum and in the lesson plans in all the education systems. And I would and just- And a graduation requirement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I would just add, and also get in the mindset that computer science can help solve global issues and global problems. You know, Absolutely. if we just have that foundational, we, we know that computer science could under, you know, help us fight hunger. It could help us develop um, different systems around clean air and clean water. So it's not just, you know, computer science, it's what it can do to support these global problems that we have and help solve them to make it just a better world for everyone to live in. Yep. And I think that, you know, we, we know this generation is really passionate about being um, leaders of that change and being stewards of these issues. And we have giant global challenges that need innovation. So my wish is that every student has the skills they need to, to create a new future, a more abundant and um, equitable future for us all. So um, I am so grateful for your time. Thank you both for joining us and sharing your thoughts. I am also really grateful for your tenacity and the work that you do every day to chip away at this problem. Um, it was already hard and now it has gotten harder. And um, you are doing really incredible work on behalf of the students of this world. And we're grateful for you and for our partnership. So with that, I will close and um, invite everyone who's attended to go check out code.org, learn more about their incredible work, our partnership and how they can get involved. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Lindsay.
Hello, uh, welcome to Pluralsight. Uh, my name is Dominic Jukes. I'm Director of Field Marketing here at Pluralsight um, in the UK, um, and I'm going to be your host for this session. Um, I'm joined by Joe Pringle. Um, thank you, Joe, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, Joe's uh, uh, Business Development for AI and Machine Learning at AWS um, and has kindly um, kindly said yes to supporting this session, uh, where we're going to be talking about sort of putting machine learning in the uh, into the hands of every learner um, and ultimately, we're trying to inspire you with the uh, you know, the art of the possible with uh, with uh, AI and machine learning as well. Um, so, uh, if you're new to the Bright Talk platform while watching this, a couple of things for you to know. Um, the first one is there's a question mark on the right hand side. If you have got any questions, type them while you think about them. Just click on that question mark. Type your question in the box um, because if you're thinking about something later, um, you'll find you can't type fast enough. So. Ask the questions as you uh, as you think of them. Uh, the other thing as well is at the end of this session, uh, I'll be giving you some information uh, and some resources about some free events and some resources that you can access as a participant of this session. Um, so uh, I'll be highlighting that a little bit later on. So make sure you stay to the end for um, for those details. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand you over to to Joe. All right, thank you so much, Dominic. I appreciate it, and I'm gonna fire a uh, screen share here and uh, I'll just start by saying I'm thrilled to be here and welcome to today's session on machine learning uh, again as as Dominic mentioned I'm a, I'm a part of the AI machine learning team at AWS for public sector and what what I thought I would do today is share some examples of what what are we seeing uh, out there in terms of how AI machine learning are being applied by our customers and partners what types of problems are they solving and also how are they how are they going about it how are they getting started with ai machine learning and building their their skills and capacity for that so I, I wanted to start with just a brief explanation. Uh, I know many of you know this already, but just just a level set of what what is ex what is machine learning exactly, and then and then go into use cases and just sort of look at look at things. What what does AI look like in practice? And uh, I, I'm going to share some of the things that we're seeing just a lot of activity around, and then uh, talk a bit about sort of our capabilities at AWS and, and sort of how we're thinking about it. What are, what are we focused on to help our customers take advantage of these new tools? And then lastly, I'll, I'll share some ideas and some best practices for how you can get started. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on definitions, but but just at a very high level, I have some some working definitions that I use that I think are handy, and and everyone you know has different ways of saying these things, but but for me, I, I like to think of AI as a way to describe any system that can replicate tasks that, that usually require a human, like recognizing things in photos or understanding human speech. Machine learning implies the use of, of large amounts of data often to, to create models. And, and actually machine learning tends to underpin most of the, the types of AI that we see today. And in, in many cases, we're, we're using historical data about something we care about. And in effect, we're, we're teaching machines or we're teaching computers with that, that data how to do something useful. Maybe it's how to recognize a pattern or how, how to make a prediction or how to generate some sort of insight. And then finally, deep learning is a subset of machine learning and it uses a specific technique known as neural networks. And these, these the neural networks, in, in some ways they mimic how a human brain works and it just turns out they're they're really really good at handling some types of machine learning problems and they support more uh, more sophisticated AI in some cases than was previously possible. Also, over the past years, uh, the past few years, there's there's been this big shift, and and the, the 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 big shift has been the use of AI machine learning has gone has gone mainstream. It's gone from the domain of big technology companies or big uh, big research institutions to uh, everyday or organizations that aren't in the the tech space, and uh, and that's been a, a, just a game changer in terms of the amount of activity that we're seeing. And this this is due to three key things. One is there's this enormous increase. I mean, it's a cl cliche, everybody talks about it, but the growth of data is actually incredibly useful for machine learning because we can use those data to train models. 
There's second, there's been this increase in cloud platform computing power. We can we can do so much more with cloud to move data around and apply compute to machine learning than we can with traditional approaches. Uh, and then and then lastly, there's improved tools and improved know-how. And how do you how do you take these these tools and apply them to a business problem. So that know-how is actually criti critically important in terms of the adoption of AI machine learning. So we really are at a, a tipping point where uh, where we're we're just seeing all these real live business business use cases and business impacts of of AI being used, and that, that could be transforming the customer experience and interacting with customers and users more effectively. It can be improving operations and operational excellence. It can be making decisions and getting certain types of insights that you couldn't get before, or or driving innovation. So. I wanted to share an example, uh, actually a set of examples. What, what does that actually look like? What does it look like? What 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 parts of these problems does AI actually solve? And uh, the first I wanted to talk about is search. And in most large organizations, employees uh, spend a tremendous amount of time looking for stuff, looking for documents or answers or uh, other data. And, and it's something like 80% of the data in a typical organization is unstructured. And uh, and that makes it hard. That makes search a, a very hard problem. Traditional, a keyword-based or statistical-based search tools, they just, they just haven't kept up with the growth of unstructured data. Also, in many search scenarios, the user is they're they're looking for an answer to a question, and they're they're uh, and often like a lot of the tools out there, they don't return answers; they return lists of things. They return lists of links or lists of files, and then we still put a a, a high burden on the user to actually click into one of those things and find the actual answer. And so th this slide shows so some of what we've been working on in this area of how do we bring machine learning to search. And we have a service called Kindra, for example, and it, it, we're, we're trying to solve a couple key problems. One is we're, we're trying to understand the intent of a search query. So rather than take all the keywords of the search query, search query and try to match them with probabilities, we're, we're trying to understand what, what is the goal of the query? What is the user's qu question they're trying to answer? And so we have a number of approaches we use for that that involve machine learning. And then second, we use machine learning to chunk out the documents or the unstructured text in a way that when, when we understand that query, now we can return the answer in the form of a, a snippet or a number. When someone says, hey, where's the help desk? We can say it's on the first floor rather than a link to the help desk support page or so, something like that. So search is like a huge, a hugely active area right now with, with machine learning. Another key aspect of content, uh, finding content and search, another key challenge that many uh, large organizations face is metadata. And metadata is, it's essential for, uh, for finding content. And, and that goes for media, like when you think of like videos or audio or images or other things like that. And, and so one of, the, one of the things we really need to have good metadata for is, is making content easy for users to find and access and use. And so, so a lot of our customers have just a huge you know oceans of media content like media and entertainment and publishing companies and education and education technology and for them extracting and maintaining good metadata is is both like critically important for them they're in the content delivery business and it's also a huge challenge so so this is another uh, really common use case we're seeing right now where we can apply ai as part of this and this slide shows a solution that we have that uh, uses different tools it, it uses computer vision. We have a service called Amazon Recognition where we can take images and videos and we can detect things. We can figure out what's in the image or what's in the video. That's metadata. We can we can uh, use what's called uh, machine transcription. We have a, a tool called Amazon Transcribe. It, it can take audio and it can convert that into a transcript that is now indexable and searchable. We have a, a machine translation service that we can translate content between languages. And lastly, we have natural language processing. We can take all that unstructured text and we can find patterns. We can find phrases and entities in those, in those media assets that now we can use to help people find content and discover content.
we can apply similar approaches to documents. A lot of our enterprise customers spend a ton of time managing documents. And that includes extracting metadata, similar to media. Uh, uh, but it also includes things like uh, a lot of customers out there, they extract text from forms. See, if you take lots and lots of applications or in education, it might be transcripts or uh, there might be claims forms of different types that customers receive, you know, just thousands and millions of these forms. And then it's a huge effort to take the, 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 the data on those forms that have been filled in and, and enter it into some case management system or some database. So this is a, a huge area of busy work. And AI sometimes can be really good at, at reducing unnecessary busy work. We can automate certain aspects of that process and save a bunch of time so people can do more, more value added things. There, there's also other aspects of documents that we can use AI like PII redaction. If we, if we have lots of documents with PII and we wanna make those available to certain people who shouldn't, shouldn't have access to the PII, we can identify the PII and redact that and make those, make it make really reduce a lot of the friction for sharing certain types of data. Once we've extracted metadata, once we've classified content, we, we can start to think about content consumption. How do, we, how do we serve our users? How do we deliver content to our, our potential customers, our users, our, our students, or our viewers? And in particular, uh, you know, how, do we, how do we make them discover content that they, they may not be aware of? So I, I already mentioned search. Search is useful when someone has a question and they're looking for something. But uh, but in some cases, we want to present content to users who who maybe they have a need, they're interested in something, but they're not quite sure how to search for it. And so a super powerful tool for that is personalization. And this is something we've been doing for uh, for over 20 years. We, we actually uh, have had um, uh, you know a tremendous amount of expertise applying personalization to Amazon.com as part of our retail business. At AWS, we've work to create that same approach and package it up. We have a service called Amazon Personalize that uses those same tools so we can help customers recommend content to their users. And one thing that makes personalization so, so useful is we can understand interaction data. Interaction data might be what, what is someone searching on or what are they clicking on or what 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 are they purchasing? And and that's a really powerful signal for what are they trying to do now? That's totally different from what did they buy last month or what did they look at last month? We can understand what are they looking for now? And that's super helpful if we want to recommend other content that's useful to them. And that could be e-commerce. It could be media. It could be publishing if we're displaying content. It could be education. There's, there's a tremendous number of use cases for personalization. Fraud is a big issue, uh, and it's actually been in the news a lot lately with all the, the programs that have been rolled out uh, as part of the CARES Act and others. And uh, it actually impacts our customers in both the commercial space and, and the public sector. And, and many organizations that we've worked with, they've, they've been you know, trying to detect and prevent fraud for many years. They've often developed what are called rules-based approaches for fraud, where they're trying to have a set of criteria and identify, hey, is this, is this transaction suspicious? Or is this new account sign up suspicious? Or is this claim suspicious in some way? The, the problem with rules-based approaches is they don't scale very well. You have to have a lot of, a lot of uh, technical and business experts or domain experts constantly adjusting the rules to keep up because fraud fraudsters are very motivated to f to figure out the rules and find ways around them and and that's where machine learning uh, can become very useful um, often machine learning uh, one, one thing it's really good at is taking large amounts of data and finding patterns and spotting anomalies and uh, and that's super useful in, in combating fraud and in and also one key aspect of machine learning is it can adapt as user behavior changes the machine learning models can adapt and they don't require a room full of humans a room full of humans constantly updating and changing the rules to adjust so fraud is, a, is another very uh, you know a, a very active area for machine learning
AI can be used to help engage customers and users and citizens. And uh, many of our customers are, are, are looking for ways of how do they be more responsive? How do they, how do they deliver richer interactions online? How do they provide more help uh, when someone reaches out with a question? How do, how do they provide that answer faster? Uh, and so ma many of our customers are, are using conversational AI to, uh, to, to provide more engagement, more interaction, more responsiveness to their customers. And also they, they, they don't replace humans to who pick up the phone and answer questions, but they complement humans and they allow humans to scale better and focus on more complex situations. Um, and so that's that's one key aspect of of conversational AI. Uh, but there's there's actually a lot more that we're seeing lately where we can also when we do engage, when a, when a human agent does pick up the phone, we can use AI to help them be more effective. And that, that's what I'm showing on the screen here is we can take a phone conversation and in near real time we can create a transcript of that conversation. We can understand what is the topic of that conversation? What is the sentiment? And we can recommend actions to that agent to help them uh, uh, respond with the, the most appropriate suggestions or actions. So there's some really powerful things we can do to, to improve the way we engage with, with outside stakeholders. We can also, as an aside, we can take all those engagements and we can analyze them and understand trends and where are we doing well and where, where, where do we have issues or, or frequent complaints so we can continually improve how we're serving customers and, and citizens and others. Machine learning is great at certain types of forecasting problems where uh, we might want to take a large amount of historical data and forecast some future trend or future event. This might be, in, in our case, we've been doing it for many years around product demand and fulfillment or uh, it might be staffing needs, or it might be financial trends. It, 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 machine learning is, it, again, it's, it's very good at certain types of problems and forecasting is one of them. We have a service that we've we've taken a lot of that expertise we've developed on our retail side and packaged it up in a set of forecasting tools where these are um, uh, pre-built models that we can, where a customer can take some historical data and run them through these models and get back more accurate forecasts than they, they often can with, with traditional methods. Okay, so that, that was just a, a quick tour of kind of what's going on out there. What, what are some use cases and examples to get your wheels turning? And uh, maybe just sort of see what, what, is, what does AI or, or machine learning look like in a business context? Now, I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and just talk about well, how, how are we at AWS, how are we trying to help our customers take advantage of this? And, and I guess there's a, a couple high level comments I'll make and then I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you a bit about our toolbox. Um, but at, at a high level, the, the this uh, applying machine learning in a business context is, is something we've been doing for for more than 20 years we were you know we were a way early adopter of how do we take uh, you know move machine learning out of the research domain and actually apply it to business problems like um, like personalization on amazon.com or fulfillment and supply chain optimization or things like alexa and conversational ai so we've been doing we've been doing uh and investing in machine learning for a very long time and at aws our goal is to to package those capabilities up to build them into different types of tools and services that allow our customers to do the same and our our our, our objective the reason we're sort of investing or building things the way we are is we're, we're trying to make machine learning easier we're trying to make it faster we're trying to abstract away some of the complexity so that our customers don't have to build things from the ground up and they can move a little faster one other comment is we also have this philosophy of we're, we're trying to make sure our customers have the right tool for the job. And this might be no matter how big or small they are or how, how big their uh, data science or machine learning team is or what kind of problem they're focused on, we're, we're trying to ensure they have the right tool for the job that helps them move faster and, and accomplish their goals. So those, those are just some, some general comments. 
just for those of you who just kind of want to know what's what's on the truck or what what are the tools we have for doing this 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 slide shows that i'm not going to go through every single um every single tool in our stack but i, I did want to make a couple comments and there's if you go to uh you know um our website and our machine learning site there's there's lots of information on all these tools and i'd be be happy to answer any follow-up questions but but as a uh, just a big picture way to think about it you can think of your stack as having three layers. Uh, there's this uh, there's this bottom layer of the stack where our focus here is on having the latest greatest frameworks and interfaces and infrastructure really for expert machine learning practitioners. These are power tools for power users. We have all the, you know, all the popular frameworks uh, and, you know, including TensorFlow and PyTorch and MXNet. And what we've found is that with most of our customers, actually like 90% of our customers, most of them use more than one framework. And, and so uh, our, our focus here is how do we optimize these for use on, use on our platform? How do we ensure interoperability and flexibility and uh, the right infrastructure that can be used for the, you know, for really allowing that maximum degree of control and flexibility for customers who, who want that. For those customers that don't have machine learning, you know, engineers on, uh, you know, a whole room full of them or deep uh, machine learning data science expertise, uh, but who still want to build machine learning models, who want to take data and they want to train models that are, that predict things or deliver insights. We have a, a middle layer. This, this is called uh, Amazon SageMaker. And it's, it's really a collection of services that take each step of a typical machine learning project and make it a little faster and a little easier. The, the reality is machine learning is uh, it, that the tools have gotten immensely better and easier to use, but there's, there's still a fair amount of complexity. There's a lot of wrangling and plumbing and configuration steps that need to happen for a typical machine learning project. So what, what we've uh, developed is, is a set of services that, uh, again, it, it abstracts away some of that complexity and busy work, and it lets a data science team focus on the, the unique stuff, the important stuff for whether they're assembling the right data or developing the right data to train the models, if they're doing exploratory data analysis or evaluating certain types of, of potential models, if they're building and training and tuning models, or then deploying those models into production and managing those models. There's there's a lot of different steps there. And for each of those, we have a, a set of capabilities that that support a typical process. And again, make it easier and faster and also provide better connective tissue between all those steps. And, and rather than using all sorts of different tools for each step, try to unify them into a more coherent environment and set of, set of tools. And then lastly, at the top of the stack, uh, we have a set of capabilities for organizations who do, do, they don't wanna build machine learning models. They don't wanna take data and run it through the steps I just described, but they, they wanna leverage AI. They wanna build AI capabilities into their applications or systems or platforms. And this is where we have what, what we call managed services or AI services. These are pre-built models where we've, we've done all the machine learning stuff, taken the images in the video or the text or audio. We've, we've created these, these uh, managed models that you can access through an API and you can send uh, images and video to our vision service recognition and you can get back metadata or other um, uh, other object detection types of things. Uh, you can, for speech to, speech to text and text to speech, which is huge for accessibility, uh, you can access those services. You can use our natural language processing tool, Comprehend, and uh, as well as translate uh, text from one language to another. You can extract text from forms, and, and including structured forms that have tables and key value pairs and things like that. Um, earlier, I mentioned Kindra, our search service. We have a, a chat capability that's similar to Alexa. Uh, it's based on the same underlying technology, but allows you to have web chat and SMS chat, and voice chat in different ways. Uh, personalization, I mentioned earlier, forecasting, fraud detection, development tools for uh, for applying machine learning to code and contact uh, contact center uh, intelligence where we want to uh, improve interactions with citizens and customers okay so that's a lot of information there's a lot of tools there um, again if anybody's interested in hearing more about that I'm happy to follow up
I, r- r- now I, I wanted to kind of pivot and and wrap up by giving you a few ideas of how, how do you get started with this? How do you get started with evaluating AI machine learning? How do you get started with a, a first project? And, and th- these are just some best practices we've observed and they, they don't apply the same way to everybody, but just some general guidance that, um, uh, that you know, for if you're thinking about this or if you're at a certain stage in uh, either evaluating or adopting AI machine learning, these are just some, some things to think about. First is is data, and especially if you're building your own models, you need to get, get your data house in order. I'm, I'm gonna make another comment on that in a minute. Second, it's it's often, uh, sometimes we hear customers, you know, they say, hey, we wanna do machine learning, or we wanna do AI. And, and the first question I'll ask is why? What, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And uh, sometimes there's a million different problems. There's tons of ideas. It's easy to get excited, and and sometimes it's it's necessary to prioritize. And and that's that's often we'll come in and help with that. We'll say, hey, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're seeing be successful. Here's where maybe you can get some high you know high value with less less uh, less time or effort required. Why don't we start with uh, something around that? So um, that's the second piece. The the third is developing your team. And I, I, there's amazing tools, there's incredible vendors out there that are building AI capabilities that make it easier, but it is, it's important to have in-house expertise. That's part of, you know, part of why we work with Pluralsight is uh, it's, uh, and we've seen this a lot actually, is our most successful customers, it's not just about finding the right technology, but it's about building the skills of your team so that you know how to, you know, A, you know what to apply those tools on, you know, the right business problems, you can have a good strategy around AI. And then second, it's it's how to adopt and use them in different ways. So I'll, I'll make another comment or two on that. There's, there's, I mean, culture is another thing. AI is, it's new and sometimes there's uncertainty. We don't know, uh, we don't often know exactly how effective it's going to be. It's gotten tremendously easier to test out, uh, but it also, uh, uh, sometimes the best way to vet out a use case is to try it out, try some content, run it through an AI service, see what we get back and then iterate. And sometimes that takes a, a culture of just risk taking and being being willing to try things and fail fast and pick pick winners, that sort of thing. And then lastly, removing undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, often uh, the, the tools are getting so much better. Everything's moving so fast. Like what you would have done three years ago is totally different from what you would do today. The models are different. There's so much more like power with deep learning out there now. The, the tools are all changing so fast that it's important to, to kind of continually refresh your understanding of those tools and avoid not necessarily building something from the ground up. If it's if, if someone has already done the plumbing, take advantage of that and build the, the value added stuff on top of that. Okay, just briefly about data. This is a, it's just a super important topic. Sometimes, you know, machine learning is super cool and, and it's kind of a nice shiny object to talk about. But if you really want to get value, if if in some of our customers, their their killer value is because they have unique data. And uh, the, the big opportunity for them is, is using machine learning to get unique insights or unique in, unique capabilities from those data. And that takes some effort. That takes some effort to, to operationalize data in a way that it's amenable for machine learning. You can't just sort of slap machine learning tools on top of all your enterprise systems. You have to you have to move data through a series of steps. Often, you know, when we do a lot of this at AWS is, is helping customers operationalize their data. And that sometimes that can be the most important part of uh, that journey of helping you know, realize the value and and doing that in a way that is a it's enterprise grade and and it's it scales with all their systems and tools and it's compliant with security or other compliance requirements uh, and often with machine learning we're applying it to our most sensitive data and uh, so we need to we need to make sure every step in those data pipelines is uh, complies with security and compliance requirements. Requirements. So that's just a, a couple comments. Uh, something we spend a lot of time on with with our customers.
Uh, we, we do give a, 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 a lot of help. Like one one thing, we we love talking about AI machine learning. We we love sitting down with customers and helping them map out a strategy, figure out what the right things to focus on. Uh, we um, we encourage. We we spend a lot of effort making it easy to try things and do proofs of concept. Sometimes we give a little help for that. Sometimes we just sort of teach customers how to fish. And and lastly, we have this philosophy. Like you know, it's. Ultimately, if you want to if you want to get value, if you want to see results, uh, you need to put things in production. You need to put insights or predictions or useful, you know, outputs of all this machine learning stuff into the hands of people like practitioners or customers or or employees or partners. Uh, who or, so ultimately you're you're delivering something to them in the context of their their workflow, uh, their uh, business application or some transactional application or case management. We want to embed the outputs of machine learning where your users are, when, when and where they need it. Okay, so so uh, last slide. Uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that point about building in-house capabilities and building in-house skills. We, we just see this as a, a big success factor uh, for organizations. And we do have customers that say, hey, we can't we can't move ahead uh, because we don't have that. We don't have that yet. And the good news is there's so much out there now that you can you can build your skills. You can build capacity over time. And we've we've created a lot of stuff, a lot of labs and hands-on tools, and uh, you know examples that you can you can access through AWS. Uh, and we've also packaged some of that. And, and there's something called Machine Learning University on AWS that you can access. But we've also spent a lot of time working with with partners like Pluralsight where they, uh, you know, they just take this to the next level in terms of making content available around every aspect of machine learning, every topic from the strategy side to the, to the um, kind of the process uh, parts of machine learning to the technical parts. And also uh, not, it's uh, much of it is not AWS specific, but there's also uh, training and content around how do you use uh, AWS tools in different ways. Okay, so for for that's that's really what I wanted to share, and and with that, I thought I would uh, maybe pa pass it back to Dominic, and we can open it up for a little bit of conversation. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, so some really uh, sort of inspirational but practical examples I think that you shared there as well I think for a lot of people um, you know getting started with machine learning there's often uh, you know sort of pie in the sky ideas to get started whereas actually you know when you're talking about you know speech interpretation and things like that it's far more realistic to uh, to, to think about and, and perhaps to put into people's minds of what they do on their daily uh, you know in their daily daily work um, so uh, some some questions for you. So again, if, if uh, as you're watching this, there's a question mark on the right hand side that you can uh, you can type, click and type your questions in. Um, a question for you, actually, first, Joe, which is you talked about a lot of the skills required. How did you get started in machine learning? Did you did you start and learn, or did you come from another role and through curiosity find your way in machine learning? How did yeah. that happen? Yeah. Okay. Now, great question. So yeah, I come. I you know I work on the public sector side, so m most of my background, I guess I started early on in my career doing like technology consulting. So I was working with large enterprise organizations trying to figure out how do we how do we adopt and use technology in different ways. And, you know, this was long before machine learning, you know, became mainstream. And then I, I gradually uh, for, you know, 10 years or so, I started to work on on data and my my focus or my interest was how do we how do we leverage data to to solve problems? And and f, you know for a long time the conversation was about analytics, like how do we how do we make surface data and and make it useful to people? How do we answer questions with data? So so I did that for a number of years, and then just the past few years actually, as machine learning has become such a powerful tool, I've I've uh, I guess I just sort of f f you know naturally began to focus on machine learning because of that interest. Like I, I'd say my interest is how do you, you know, how do you help a large complicated organization take advantage of all the data they generate? They, you know, they, they tend to like generate so much data, but often it goes into some, you know, it goes into some, bowel of some system and it gets locked away. And so a lot of times what, what I get most excited about is how do we how do we tap into that and how do we answer questions with it or how do we how do we improve 
aspirations or outcomes in different ways. So that's a little bit about my, my journey on, on that. Mm. And, and would you say, and that's, it's interesting, and, and for others thinking about steps into it, because you, you talk, um, you know, you start off by showing a kind of uh, a roadmap, perhaps from an organizational level, and obviously where Pluralsight come in, we're about the, you know, sort of the, the skills needed to, uh, to move into that area. Um, data looks to be such an important part of machine learning anyway. I mean, how, would you would you say it's, you know, 75% of the task is just really being comfortable with knowing and understanding and, and manipulating data in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like a, a cliche. If you talk to a data scientist or a machine learning team, they'll say, you know, 80% of the effort, 75% of the effort is that upfront data prep. And it is, you know, everyone says it so much, it's almost, you know, again, it's just easy to, uh, you know, not think about it, but it is, it is true. It is a lot of times the hardest part is how do you get data out of the, that valuable data that's buried in your enterprise systems? How do we pipe it out of those and make it amenable for data science and machine learning? And then how do we prepare it and wrangle it? And, and there's something called feature engineering where we're trying to figure out like, how do we, how do we set up the data set so that it will be most effective to create a predictive model. And, and so there's so many steps around data. Yeah, I would say that, you know, a, a lot of times I've come in and I talk about our tools and here's how you can do machine learning with data. But, but really the important conversation is what do you need to do before that to even get ready with, with your data? So it's a hugely, hugely important and very, very common topic with many of our customers. Yes, thank you. And and what are then the, the next sort of skills? So again, I'm thinking more for people who are thinking, okay, this is, uh, you know, this is inspiring me a little bit and I want to start thinking about what can I do for my organization or for myself? What are the other associated skills that they might need to have or may not need to have but could develop? Okay. Well, I, you know, I think we tend to see a couple uh, a couple situations. Sometimes we're working with an organization that has great develop, developer talent, and they have uh, you know people who know how to build software, but they're new to machine learning. And machine learning is kind of unique in that it combines uh, traditional software engineering and writing code with data science and statistics and math. And th that's like a, you know, it's, it's, it, it sometimes means when we're talking with a, a team of developers, they need to build their skills around the kind of the, the principles of data science and, and, and some of that, those math fundamentals. And, and then going into like, there's a, a big like algorithmic aspect of machine learning where you need to learn like, here's what the different models do. Here's the kinds of problems they solve. Here's the, here's why they work the way they work. It, to really do machine learning, uh, you have to understand, you have to understand how it works so you can explain it to people. And that takes sometimes with some customers, you know, we're, we're helping developers build that kind of side of the equation. In, in other cases, we, we might have customers who they have that, they have the data science expertise, they know how to build machine learning models on their, you know, on their laptop, but they want to start to build more sophisticated models. They want to deploy models into production. They want to scale big deep learning models that can't, you know, you can't do on the, the workstation under your desk. And so in those cases, they're, the skills they need are more on the data engineering side. They need to learn how to use cloud platforms to move data around and to set those data pipelines up and use all those, those upstream kind of data management tools that often are, uh, again, it's, a, it's, it's because machine learning involves both of those pieces, very rare, you know, most people, myself included, they're not coming to the table just magically having, having all that expertise. So that, that's just a few, few comments on that, on that question. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. And um, how would you, if, if, if organizations don't have a strategy around machine learning at this point, how would you, you know, would you, how would you recommend people start thinking about that if they haven't got that in place, you know, that they perhaps sat there and thought this is going to be something we need to do, but where should they, where should they start? Have you got some guidance yeah. around that? Yeah, that's that's awesome. I uh, great question. I think, um, you know, often I, I do think it's important to just, read read about what your competitors or your comparator organizations are doing there's so much you know there's every ten, most 
so, sometimes people are very secretive about what they want, what they're doing with AI, but but sometimes people want to, you know, they want to talk about it and they want to publicize it. So I, I think just getting familiar and like, what are the use cases that are being solved in my space? What are the problems? What what are the the problems where people are actually applying AI? I think is a, a useful uh, a, a useful area to explore. That's something we also help a lot with. Like a frequent session I'll deliver is just sharing like. Here's what we're seeing, and and kind of going a little deeper than what we did today, where we just dig into like here's the use cases that are relevant to you. Here is, and then and then often that'll be a two way conversation where we're trying to learn well what what's your you know what problems are you guys trying to focus on? And so I think there's a there's a problem definition aspect of that strategy, and and in some cases. I like to think of it as um, you know let's get let's get a list of problems on the board, and then and then try to understand like what's the value of solving each problem and what's the effort required to use machine learning for each problem. You can get a little, you know, decision matrix there of like that shows your your ROI that you could use. And, and a, a great way to start um, is to do that exercise and then pick an achievable POC where you don't pick the hardest problem, even if it's like the highest value one and it's the most important thing for your business. And some, sometimes I, this, this, this is actually advice from a number of other folks that, uh, that, that I, you know, is not an original thought of mine, but it's don't pick the hardest problem first. And sometimes, you know, just pick, pick an easy problem that has some business value that's worth spending some time and effort on. And if you're successful, people will see value, but, but, don't pick the hardest one on the list. And then that way you can, you can do a couple of things. You can show value to the business and you can build capacity at the same time. And you sort of learn, okay, here's what it takes and here's who needs to be involved. And then, and then that sort of sets you up to begin to tackle some of those other, other problems. Okay, thank you. That is a good piece of uh, good piece of advice for uh, for people wanting to get get started. So, okay, well, with that, I'm going to draw things to a to a close. Um, Joe, thank you very much for your for your time and your participation on this uh, on this session. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, for those people who are watching, so I promised uh, a few uh, a few sort of juicy morsels at the end of this session. So uh, we've talked about uh, skills development to a degree on uh, on this session as well, and within the attachments in this bright talk presentation there are links to a couple of uh, AWS machine learning and AI courses on the Pluralsight platform. So if you're interested in uh, starting to develop and take some of what uh, Joe's talked about here um, yourselves, the links will take you to the platform if you're subscribing. If you're not, uh, you can always talk to us about sorting out a pilot or uh, signing up for a uh, for a short-term trial. Um, so those are, are available um, for you in the, uh, in the attachment links. The other thing is if you're interested and have enjoyed this session as well, um, within a month, time so just uh, sort of midway through october we're going to be running plural site live um plural site lives our annual technology conference um and this year it's virtual and it's free um and it's uh, it's global as well so we're running a lot of things on a lot of different time zones um so there's a lot of innovators industry leaders uh, keynote speakers. So uh, we've got people like Simone Gertz, who uh, you may have seen making uh, building robots of dubious quality. I'm not going to say what her YouTube channel is actually called, but uh, she's going to be one of our keynote speakers um, at that event. There's a link there for you to uh, to sign up. Um, the other thing as well is we've got, um, uh, if you're interested in uh, our free uh, state of upskilling report, so we uh, plural site survey, something like 1500 uh, technologists and practitioners um, across eight countries to look at the state of upskilling today. So there's a link to that report that you can access, um, as well as if you're interested in assessing your own skills in a number of different areas, including machine learning, um, you can take a skill IQ, which is uh, there's a link there for a skill assessment. It takes about five minutes. Uh, 20, 25 questions, and you can give yourself a sense of where your knowledge is uh, today and perhaps where those next steps uh, might be. And then finally, I'd like to say as well, if you uh, have also enjoyed this, there are other uh, Pluralsight sessions within Bright Talk. So if you look at the Pluralsight channel, um, there are a number of other customers and, uh, and, and, and partners telling their stories uh, in conjunction with, with Pluralsight. So I'd encourage you to have a look there. There's, there's more content there for you. So with that, thank you very much for attending this session. Joe, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. And uh, you know, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks uh, for having the, me. In the preparation. And for everyone else, thank you very much. And uh, with that, I shall end the talk. Thank you. Bye, everybody.
Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Hawthorne, and I'm coming to you from Red Hat's Open Source Program Office in our Office of the CTO. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about how the open source way promotes creativity and innovation, namely how open source software projects and communities have architected their social systems to produce the best possible outcomes for collaboration and co-creation. So a little bit about why uh, I think these messages are important to share with you today. Um, we live in very interesting times. Um, there are tensions all around us in the areas of global trade, um, how we are stewarding our planet, what we owe to one another as human beings, how we can architect systems that serve the most vulnerable of our populations so that they serve everyone. Uh, for, you know, all of us are only waiting for our moment in which we become vulnerable. And I'm here to share some of the lessons learned that I've seen over the past 20 years where open source software projects have been able to uh, successfully collaborate and co-create with people from all over the world, all walks of life, across every time zone, every cultural background, every native language, and to produce um, better outcomes really strengthened uh, by their differences instead of challenged by them. So before diving into the meat of how open source uh, software communities work, I think it's really important to explain what open source software is for those who just may not be familiar with the concept. So if you have a phone in your pocket running Android, if you have ever used um, uh, the Mozilla Firefox browser, uh, if you have ever, if you're a data scientist and you use Jupyter Notebooks, um, you've been using open source software. And there are some key freedoms uh, associated with uh, open source software projects. So anyone can use the software for any purpose. You can view the source code and audit it. You can understand how it works um, under the hood. And anyone is free to modify the software, right? So if you are creating something and you discover that it doesn't quite meet your use case, you can change it and make it better. And you may discover that changes and enhancements um, come to you from unlikely places. Perhaps you find something that was created by uh, a hobbyist. Perhaps you find something created by someone at a competitor's company who can help you uh, get done what you need to get done that much better and faster. Uh, and last but not least, one of the key fundamental principles of open source software is this concept of sharing, right? Um, everyone who is interested in or invested in the outcome of that particular software project um, can share their modifications and um, collaborate in order to take that code base and uh, improve it for not only the betterment of the, the folks doing the creation, but anyone who wants to make use of the software. So for those who are familiar with uh, the open source uh, software movement, you know, it started around 30 years ago and, and once upon a time it was uh, something that was more fringe. People didn't necessarily understand uh, what open source was and how it worked. People thought potentially it was uh, less secure. There were, there were many misconceptions, but at this point in, uh, in our technological evolution, I think open source software is, um, you know, fairly well understood by most folks who are working in the technology space. And if you look at uh, the results of a recent study conducted uh, on Red Hat's behalf, the state of enterprise open source, you know, more than more than half of the respondents all across the world in most cases, or, you know, around half are, you know, noting that open source software is ubiquitous in uh, the way that they use uh, it for their mission critical IT infrastructure, right? Everywhere from uh, security solutions to uh, big data and analytics to how they're managing their, their cloud presence. So we've heard the, often heard the phrase, uh, software is eating the world. And another phrase that is becoming just as well-worn is uh, so, uh, open source software is eating software. What are some of the values of open source software projects and communities as, as they pertain to, to co-creation and collaboration and why are those important for, for us to consider? So uh, for open source software projects, anyone can contribute. And this isn't just about uh, the creation of software, but it's about the creation of any of the artifacts that are essential for a well-functioning uh, software project. So the very definition of open source software, first of all, forbids discrimination uh, against any persons or groups from participating in, in the creation of that software. And there's also uh, an injunction against discriminating against any particular field of endeavor when you're calling software open source. So for example, you cannot make source code available, but say people are not allowed to use it to um, 
keep count of the llamas in their field, for example. And this this idea that anyone can contribute by definition, I think is uh, a fundamental aspect of understanding why open source software has come to be ubiquitous in our modern, com modern computing infrastructure, right? There, uh, the idea that anyone who has an internet connection, a computer, and a desire to contribute is welcome and encouraged to, to share their talents, be those as a software developer, a quality assurance tester, a user experience designer, a documentation expert, um, or you know someone who likes to focus on like bringing people together for events or marketing the software so that people know that it exists and that they should come and try it out and give feedback on it. And this is uh, something that has definitely evolved over time. When open source software uh, started being something that folks were working on, you know, 30-ish years ago, uh, there was more of an emphasis on this idea that, that programmers were wizards. Uh, that was the actual word used. If In order to be a, an open source software developer, you had to be special and magic. Uh, and people who came along looking for help on how to, to get started were often told to read the friendly manual, uh, except it wasn't particularly friendly when they heard it. And now if we look at the most successful open source software projects, they have they hold it as a core value, um, even before setting up the project's uh, infrastructure and community, that they need to have onboarding paths for absolutely all comers who want to come and contribute to the community with whatever their skills and talents may be. And also that if the, the software is not easy to use, if you've read the friendly manual, which should really be a friendly manual, uh, then you know it's it's a bug in the project. It's a bug in the software itself. It is not something that is that is a user error. And if we think about how we want to create positive outcomes in our daily life, the idea that we can take in information, feedback, um, ideas from anywhere in order to improve the outcomes of what we're producing, then I think that we I hope that we can all agree that. Um, you know, inspiration, innovation, creativity can come from anywhere. We just have to be willing to receive it. Uh, another very important value of the way that open source software communities work is this idea of asynchronous and non-collocated collaboration. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell about, uh, you know, an early open source software project called Subversion, which for people who are excited about version control systems, this is what we had be back before we had Git and uh, GitHub. Uh, the, the developers of the Subversion project were not all located together while they were developing this, this system. Um, they, some of the developers were in uh, the same office in California, some were located in the Midwest, and then there were other contributors and um, interested parties who were all over the world who would interact with the project developers on their email list. And there was a fundamental focus on the need to get the voices who were not in the room contributing to the project's development and forward progress, right? In fact, so much so that there was a rule that if a conversation took place in the office around the water cooler and people came up with a great idea for a new feature to implement, they actually weren't allowed to start working on it until they summarized the content of that conversation, sent it out to the project email list, and then waited a certain amount of time to take in feedback from other people who were following along or who were potentially interested in co-creating that particular feature, just because, again, all of the voices and expertise aren't all in the same room. And especially for the, the asynchronous aspect, there was a, a definite understanding that, you know, you needed to take time for people to respond, right? People wouldn't necessarily be um, always at their keyboard at the time something was being discussed. So discussions were left open sometimes for a couple of weeks or more about what, what to do to move things forward in the project because there was a, an explicit desire to have everyone uh, have the benefit of, of knowledge sharing and uh, a shared sense of, of forward progress. And when I look at how we're, we're all experiencing time now, how our approaches to life have shifted um, based on kind of our, our new paradigm of existence uh, right these days, I think this emphasis on, on asynchronous and non-collocated collaboration is extremely important. First of all, we, we are not in the position we once were where we can just walk down the hallway and tap someone on the shoulder and share ideas with them. Uh, we need to be really more thoughtful and deliberate in how we communicate uh, our needs and our feedback and our uh, our plans to move forward. And I also know that as, as our, our sense of time has changed um, based on how we're living our lives differently now, this, this, uh, this acceptance of the asynchronicity of our communications and, and even a value of asynchronous communication, 
uh, has really increased based on my own personal experience and that of my colleagues and friends. Uh, because we understand that we're not we're not doing things as we once were, right? We we understand that we don't always necessarily need to have an immediate response. We don't necessarily need to be always on. We don't necessarily need to respond to every push notification. We can take more time to be deliberate and thoughtful and reflective about the choices that we're making and what it is that we want to do with our time, with our decisions, and how we can use that. Uh, that sense of asynchronicity to potentially produce much better outcomes while we all work together to create the best possible product. Another key aspect of open source software communities and how they do their work is this idea of peer review by default. Um, so there's a well-worn phrase in open source software projects, release early, release often. And that underpins the idea that you will, you will take what you're doing, your work in progress, and you'll put it out for feedback while that work continues to be very much in draft and in progress, right? To take in, uh, you know, the opinions of others as you are doing your work, as opposed to producing something that is nearly polished and complete, and then asking people to give you input on on the finishing touches, right? And this idea that there's going to be co-creation and collaboration that that insists upon, that has as a default value peer review throughout the development process I think is incredibly important because it allow it gives people the space to ask for help when they need it, maybe when they're stuck. It gives people the opportunity to be inspired in places that they didn't think they would be before something is utterly complete and they may feel a sense of uh, ownership or defensiveness about critique of a final product. And it also gives us just the opportunity to understand that we don't have to be perfect, right? Like none of us were born full sprung from the head of Zeus, like the goddess of wisdom, Athena, knowing everything from the moment that we, you know, entered the world. And because there is an explicit default value that we're going to take an input from our peers all along the way, uh, we can be open to that feedback. We can be open to constructive criticism. We can, we can understand that uh, what we receive from others is going to, again, lead to better outcomes and it, it sort of removes that barrier of um, defensiveness around one's creation or or even maybe the imposter syndrome of feeling like we must be an expert in all things and every single thing we produce must be unassailable in order for it to be valuable. Another way in which uh, open source software communities I think do a really great job of fostering uh, you know creativity and innovation is simply through their value on the explicit sharing of credit. Uh, if we look at our cultural values and how we think about expertise, right, there's there's kind of this idea of a single authorial voice or a, a small group of people um, who have the answers, right, and who should be those that we look to for for all of the information on a particular topic. And even as we, um, you know, have an, an ever greater explosion of uh, ideas, opinions, and facts uh, facing us today, we still cling to this idea of of the authoritative individual, right? You know, otherwise we wouldn't have the well-worn phrase in our lexicon of, you know, she wrote the book on that, right? The, the, we very much have this as, as a notion and how we understand um, value that's produced in the world, right? There's a singular point of where credit is shared and, you know, whatever contributions came into the creation of that whole are, are relegated to, to a back page uh, bibliography or index. And open source software projects have, have not really ever worked that way, right? There, once upon a time, a long time ago, there was something called an author's file that would contain the name of everyone who had contributed to, to that project. And it that author's file would ship with the code that you would were using so that at any point in time, you could understand uh, everyone who had contributed to the creation of that greater whole. If we look at modern uh, software development tools like GitHub, you can just by virtue of the design of the user interface, click through and see where someone has commented, where someone has written new software, where someone may have contributed to documentation, be it large or small. And because of this explicit sharing of credit, we really not only uh, invite people to contribute to our work, but we also make sure by default that they understand that their contribution is valued. It will be visible, it will, be, it will matter um, that our, that our toil and trouble will not uh, you know, end up being you know, a footnote uh, in the story of a greater set of success. And because of that explicit sharing of credit, I believe that people are fundamentally more invested 
when they do their work and to produce those outcomes because they know that, that again, no matter how large or how small what they have contributed, it's going to matter, it's going to be visible, and it's going to be uh, a matter of record. Uh, a fifth aspect of uh, open source software development that I think is uh, is key to this to creativity and innovation is this laser focus on iterative development and continuous improvement, right? Nothing is ever done. Something is just good enough, right? It's good enough for now, and then the next thing we produce will be good enough for them. And it, you know, if you're if you are like me and you have perfectionist tendencies, um, this is actually very comforting to work in that sort of modality to understand that. Um, that we as individuals are a work in progress, that the things that we create are always a work in progress, and that through the, the con contributions of others, through our collaboration with them, and, and what we learn from our interactions with them, we're again gonna be able to produce better outcomes, and we don't have to feel this sense of failure if what we produce is not a perfect thing the first time it's produced, there is always the opportunity to, to improve, to refine, to consider, to reflect, and to, to reiterate until we feel like we have something that's good enough today, but is better than what we had yesterday. So in conclusion, I just wanna leave you folks with this one notion, uh, creativity and innovation can come from anywhere. Uh, we just have to be open to receiving it and uh, open to, to taking in lessons from, from folks who are willing to share them with us. And fundamentally, when we work together, when we co-collaborate uh, and co-create, we create far better things together. Thanks for your time, everyone. I hope you're enjoying Pluralsight Live. Welcome everyone to the Learning Programs and Burritos sessions here at Pluralsight Live 2020. We're very excited to be joined today by Brad Keller, who is a Senior Program Manager on Technical Upskilling and Reskilling at Liberty Mutual Insurance. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, I live up to this title. I try to come up with a catchy title for this, so we'll see. Very excited to see how that build your own concept works. Uh, when talking about tech learning. So Brad, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure, um, so I've been in the learning field my whole career, so 20, geez, 25 this year, 24 years, something like that. Um, prior to coming to Liberty Mutual, I was in the e-learning um, design development area and uh, I've been with Liberty in the tech learning space for six and a half years. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, um, we in the tech learning space support all of technology across Liberty Mutual. So all engineers um, from a technical standpoint, that's about 5,000 people. Um, and I've worked in the group for uh, six and a half years. Wow, that's a, a long time, a lot of tenure at Liberty. Um, and so what do you focus on in your current role? So the biggest focus right now um, is in the upskilling, reskilling space, obviously it's a really hot area. Um, and my, my goal is to really work with senior leadership um, to understand the needs of the organization as well as our talent group uh, to also understand kind of talent mobility and kind of where our skills are and where they need to be. And we and basically try to put together our learning programs to match uh, those needs. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. And we, um, I'm already sharing this here on the screen, um, but we're highlighting three of those programs that you've worked on. Do you want to maybe share a little bit more about those programs and what specific um, things they're solving for? Yeah, so this is kind of where the concept of the build your own concept of the idea came from. Um, I've been involved, I've had the, fortunate um, experience to be involved with multiple learning programs, kind of large and small. Um, and so wanted to highlight a few of the ones that I've been involved with, and they all are sort of a little bit different, um, and kind of talk through those and kind of the aspects of them and why we made some of the decisions that we made um, for those particular programs. So maybe it makes sense, uh, Annie, to kind of go through and highlight each one if that works. I think that would be perfect. Uh, okay, great. So the ones that you see on the screen, obviously, are the three that we're focusing on. Uh, I'll start first. 
Uh, the first program is the LMI Tech Academy. LMI Tech is our uh, Liberty Mutual Investments side of Liberty Mutual. So uh, a lot of financial um, type of information that they're responsible for and uh, the technology behind a lot of that. So they're a smaller group in our organization um, in the technology space, uh, but they had a need to kind of fill, um, give an opportunity to upskill a lot of the people that are already in those roles. Um, and so what we did for this particular rollout was we looked, we worked, first of all, we worked with senior leadership. We had a, a huge buy-in from the CIO of that area, uh, Mike Willock and his senior leadership team. And we kind of looked to understand the, the basically the needs uh, within the different job roles that span his area. Um, and so where, where we landed is, and, and secondly, they, they wanted to have something that was readily available, kind of on the job, self-paced. Um, and that's kind of where we leveraged a lot of the Pluralsight uh, channel functionality, as well as a lot of the content, um, both Pluralsight content, as well as uh, a lot of external content from, you know, from our internal sites, external Pluralsight, I say. Um, but stuff that we worked with a lot of the SMEs in the space to kind of curate. So the overall structure of this particular rollout was uh, a general uh, tech foundations channel uh, that was very high level, kind of awareness level, um, uh, 101 type uh, courses on uh, various things across the organization. And then we uh, broke out three role-based channels, which I highlighted over on the right side, um, for infrastructure engineers, data engineers, and software engineers. Um, and again, we worked a lot of, uh, we worked through a lot of the content with those SMEs in those spaces. And we also have had a continuing engagement, uh, kind of a measure of engagement, um, and a lot of messaging that came from leadership to kind of support this program. How critical was having um, a, such a such a huge champion um, with the CIO? And also, what was the context in which you rolled this out? So you talked a little bit about how you structured it, how you work with the SMEs, um, the general, and then the specific roles, role based um, channels that you built out, and what composed that. Um, what about the way in which you rolled this out to the learners? What was the the messaging that you use there? What was the um, expectation that you set for them to um, how they engage with, with what you built for them? Yeah. So your, to your first question, um, having a champion for this, and I think really any large uh, learning initiative rollout is huge um, because it's, it's the consistent messaging. It's the messaging to leadership and below and it's kind of the trickle down message um, that it's a priority that we're giving you time to be able to do this, to upskill, to help not only help, um, you know, help the organization and their skills that they're needed now, but also their career development. Um, so that was a huge part. And then the way that we announced this was uh, we worked with our comms department internally uh, to be able to brand it uh, as the LMI Tech Academy. Um, we did sessions where we provided both manager and participant um, engagement and, and understand kind of how to engage with uh, the content, um, where to start, you know, questions on the platform, uh, those types of things. And then there wasn't a specific mandate on time, which is one of the things that we had talked about. Um, so in other words, it wasn't like each group has to spend, you know, two hours a week on this. It was more our the leadership team uh, let that up to uh, all the teams themselves to kind of self manage that and to kind of build it into either you know take stuff from their backlog and kind of build in learning to help solve some of those challenges. Um, they've some of the teams have gotten creative where they've done lunch and learns. Um, so what they'll do is they'll take some content and then they'll come back and share it in the lunch and learn with the rest of their team or the or or you know, outside of their team within that particular organization. So they, it's kind of cool to see that because originally I was thinking that we should have maybe um, a goal from a, from a time perspective. We didn't, uh, like I said, we didn't roll it out that way, but we've had really good engagement. 
This is great. Thank you for sharing that. I know that um, a lot of the different organizations that we partner with um, often have that dilemma of how do you how do you really um, engage your audience? Uh, do you want to set some kind of an expectation? Do you want them to um, work together with their their teams amongst their teams to um, find that perfect balance of how they're going to incorporate this into the flow of their work? So. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Do you want to talk about the full stack engineer program? Yep. So that's a, that's a a very different format, very different audience. Um, This came out of, we used to have a a very large scale reskilling program that we kicked off in 2016 and ran for about two years. And, And a lot of it was focused in software engineering space. Um, And from that, after that program sort of ended, uh, we've had a lot of people reaching out saying, where do I start? Where, I, you know, that program no longer is, is in um, existence. How do I get started? And so we've talked through, uh, I, I was kind of one of the point of contacts for this. So I got a lot of the inquiries. So over time, I was like, how can we leverage what we already have and build something for the people that are interested, but maybe they don't have, it's not a reskilling program where they're going to go to another role. They just want to kind of upskill in their current role. Um, And it could be they're doing this for the current role, they're doing it for the future role. So we took um, this blended learning approach where we we wanted to build something around self-paced content and then put structure to it um, over a time period and involve uh, an instructor uh, from one of our training uh, suppliers uh, who we partner with um, to be able to deliver sessions that complement the self-paced learning. So... Um, And we also have project-based work that the instructor is involved with. And then finally, the instructor also gives a component of support um, office hours uh, throughout the program. So the the program was around six months. It's actually still ongoing. We're not quite through the pilot. We've called it a pilot because we knew we were going to have to make a lot of iterations, and we have. Um, And we've had some lessons learned uh, on some of that where, for example, we had to allow more time for people to get through some of the content, which we kind of assumed we were, were trying to target at a certain like 12 to 15 hour a week commitment over time. And they can do the, a lot of the work on kind of as it fits their schedule. Um, but we had to kind of scale back some of the content a bit. Um, and that was one of the iterations that we've made as well as we've included more instructor led sessions as well to kind of keep, keep everyone, um, you know, in check and kind of collaborating. This is interesting. So you have, um, and oftentimes we'd see more instructor led and, and the self-based is supporting the instructor led engagement. And here you almost have the reverse because you're spending uh, most of the time working on your own. And then you're, you're setting up the instructor led piece to really, um, support what they're doing on their own, on their own time. So, yeah, we'll see the flip flop in the next one. But yeah, this one was interesting. Again, it was a pilot. Um, we're all, we've also uh, we've also tried to have a support group. Um, you know, put everyone together in, in a in a Teams channel and be able to kind of have uh, if someone has questions, other people from the cohort can interact and so on and so forth. And we have our instructor as a guest in those channels to be able to interact as well. Um, so we've tried to put support around it because obviously people are learning at different times. Uh, based on their schedule. So um, t- talking about the flip, do you want me to go ahead and un- talk a little bit about the third one? Yes, because it does look like it is. <laughs> All yeah. three of them are very different. It's like the evolution. Yeah, and so the, the third one is our Infrastructure Engineer Academy. And this was a CIO-driven initiative that they that uh, our CIO from our hosting services group, Mark Cressy, had, had come to our tech learning group and said, we know we need to put together something to give people an opportunity internally to upskill and, and become more uh, um, proficient in the DevOps space, automation, um, and infrastructure as code. And so it was very, like the requirements around this were very vague. Uh, So we had to do a lot of sort of discovery uh, to understand really what the requirements were um, talked to a lot of uh, subject matter experts in the space. And what we did is we p- 
partnered with one of our training suppliers um, who we use internally generally for like instructor like classes and we built a uh, an immersive program around this that involved it is a it is a multimodality um, the majority of the of the program is in the classroom or was in the classroom prior to uh, our covid um, challenges but it was it was built around a classroom cohort structure um, the idea is it was taking people they were being I don't want to say pulled out of their current role, but because they, they remained within their group when they came out of this program, but they were pulled off of their responsibilities to be able to focus 100% of the time uh, or as close to as they could um, on this program. And so what we did is we, we built the, the program and the structure and the format with our training supplier. We incorporated uh, Pluralsight pre-work that was required prior to um, them actually stepping foot into the classroom or in the virtual classroom, which is what it is now. Um, and then in the actual format, we've, we've since changed the format a bit with, uh, with the, you know, with COVID and the challenges that that has presented, um, which I can talk a little bit about, but uh, originally it was basically a blend of um, mainly classroom with, with uh, content that was supplemental in the self-paced realm. So, I can go into that a little bit more detail, but I know if you had any questions to kind of start. No, this is this is great. Thank you for sharing this. I'm wondering as I look at these three very different programs, which um, it looks like they all three seem to focus on role-based development, even though the full stack engineer you may not or or maybe in that role today, as you mentioned. Um, what led you to the decision of how to design them? So the format, the three different formats that you described, um, how did you make the decision around those? What, what were the drivers that, um, that led you to that? Yeah, so the, the audience, obviously, where they were coming in, the goal of the program was a, was a big driver, what, what we were trying to get out of it on the, on the, on the backside. Um, you know, those, those factors and how much time people could commit um, and kind of what the what the expectation was there um, as well so you know with LMI Tech Academy people were are still doing their day-to-day -day job there but they're we're trying to give them skills to be able to be more fluent in some of the latest technologies um, in cloud uh, you know those types of things but it was more about kind of on the job support um, and just in time whereas you know, if you look at the Infrastructure Engineer Academy, that was basically taking people and taking them. They people internally obviously have a lot of a wealth of knowledge. Um, they understand our culture, they understand our systems, but maybe they just didn't have coding skills to be able to do a lot of the the um, more uh, current automation and infrastructure automation. So we basically uh, went through a selection process. Uh, that involved a senior leadership team to be able to vet the people that were um, interested in this program and selected. A lot of times there'll be, people will express interest in the program. And again, it's just making sure that we have the right mix of, of people. Um, and then it's taking them from kind of all of their skills, combining everything that they know, and then giving them this, this new tool set that is more current that they can then become, um, you know, have business impact when they get back with their team. And we structured a lot of like this, this long-term immersive program, we structured it with breaks. Um, so generally it, it all actually started out as a, as a 12 week program. And now that we're virtual, we've, we've made it a 15 week program because we need a little bit of extra time, obviously to get through the content in a virtual environment. So that was one of the iterations that we've made. Um, we also changed the structure of the day to day so in the classroom, obviously, you can have someone's attention a lot longer than if you are, are virtual. Mm -hmm. So we kind of changed up the way that we structured um, the day-to-day -day, um, and basically broke it up with instructor-led in the, in the morning and then followed by lab work and self-paced work in the afternoons. And that's been, that's been a good break because you don't need someone's attention for that period, you know, this amount of period of time virtually. Um, so we've made a lot of iterations iterations on the fly um, and now we're in our fourth cohort uh, out of six that are happening. 
This is awesome. And yeah, you, you brought up uh, mm. some of the points of how you evolved these programs um, as a result of uh, the challenging times we've had this year. What are some other things that, I don't know if you've um, covered all of them, but um, some of the other challenges that you've had um, with all of your audience now going remote and um, how you have originally structured them and anticipated, um, you know, one outcome as, as, a, as they come out of this program and how you've had to pivot uh, with, with everything uh, being remote. Yeah. So like I said, format was a big one. And then we, we realized that we had a, in the, so in our, in our cohort number three, which ha- which was kicking off in March, um, late March, uh, obviously went full remote. We had we only had about two and a half weeks, I believe, to to pivot, and we ended up changing the, again changing the daily format. Um, we've also had to support people's work from home structure, you know, differently. Um, you know, people weren't weren't necessarily equipped to work from home that were supposed to be in this cohort because it was going to be in the classroom. So they didn't, they didn't necessarily have the you know all the setup that they would have. So we we needed to support it from that side of things. Um, we also needed to support it from a technical perspective. And when we had forty four thousand people all of a sudden uh, go work remotely, um, and our infrastructure had to support that, there were a lot of things that were rolled out and some of the tools we hadn't previously tested with our um, with our technical environment to that people are going to be working in, in the training space. So that was another, that was another um, hiccup that we had to get over. Um, So it was just a lot of those types of things. And then obviously we had to support people's um, personal situations because people were forced to be at home. Kids are at home. Um, So a lot of those things were considered as we were like basically in real time um, as we were making decisions. Um, So luckily most people were really great about working, um, working through the challenges. And, you know, I, I feel like everyone's adapted really well. We also iterated on, we do this now, but we would get feedback from people. Um, we get it weekly. We have weekly evaluations on the program to understand the challenges and any types of um, iterations that we can make on the fly. Uh, and then we, I was just, I tried to be more, you know, as a program manager, I try to be much more present uh, to to feel help people feel supported. So, um, and it, it it was great because that gave me a sense of what they were kind of going through. Um, you know, created empathy, and I think it, it. You know, I obviously want these people to succeed as much as they do. So, just trying to connect the dots between the challenges that we had and any um, things that we couldn't solve, we had to you know reach out to leadership, that kind of thing. So. It was an all around team effort and it was a lot, there was a lot of moving parts, but um, I feel like everyone handled it fairly well. Um, And now we're in this cohort that is fully remote, which was a planned remote cohort, which, you know, to expand our um, geographic reach to our other um, areas of people that are working from home or in different offices. So we already have our lessons learned and we've, we've done our iteration. So I feel like we're a lot further ahead now than we, we would have been. Uh, you accelerated to, that uh, your prep for the fully remote cohort because you had to. Yeah, so I guess that's one of the the pluses that came out of the the COVID challenge. But yeah, that's amazing. One thing that you called out that I noticed with Liberty Mutual with all of your uh, program structure programs that you run is that continuous feedback. It's such an incredible best practice. You incorporate that continuous feedback, all of your channels in Pluralsight have surveys in them to really help maintain them and keep them current. And um, some of the other programs that are actually going to be highlighted here at Pluralsight Live also incorporate segments of this continuous feedback week to week, being able to pivot as you go, regardless of, you know, changing circumstances that keeps you so agile through the process. And uh, I just I'm so glad you highlighted that because um, oftentimes this is a, a, a really small uh, component of a program that we can incorporate to, to make sure that um, you're able to do that. And as a result, as you were saying, you were able to pivot quickly and it sounds like you were able to maintain the engagement across the programs with um, all these unforeseen circumstances coming in the way. 
Yeah. So, and it's funny. I want one thing to mention too, is we um, like going back to the LNI tech Academy again, that's fully self-paced. Um, but we have regular quarterly meetings with uh, the SMEs across those channels to understand if there's um, new resources, both, you know, could be on plural side, it could be externally, it could be internally, like on our internet stuff that's specific to Liberty um, that we can call out uh, that are valuable, that someone has felt, found valuable, which will then incorporate into our channel. So that's part of that feedback loop, which is, which I agree is super important. And then from the programmatic standpoint, um, we do like for the infrastructure engineer academy, like I said, we do weekly um, evaluations. Um, and I've, at the beginning of the program, like when we, when we kind of have our orientation and then throughout the entire, like every time I have a touch point, I tell people how much we're going to bother them for feedback, but how important it is because that tells us kind of what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong and make, be able to make changes from there. Um, but I think the key is to make sure that, you know, people know that they're being heard. Um, so we try to do it the best that, you know, the best we can. And obviously we can't uh, address every single um, request, but if, you know, if eight out of the 10 people or eight out of the 15 people are saying one thing, then we need, obviously, you know, that's, that's something we need to address as soon as we can. So. Yeah. You've definitely built that culture in your learners probably <laughs> now expected <laughs> if they don't see it, that they're asking where's, where can I provide feedback? Yeah. And hopefully, I mean, honestly, that's the way we'll, we can stay agile and that's the way we can improve. And that's really the only way to improve unless we, if, if we're not hearing about it, we don't know, we might think everything's fine. So I'd rather hear the feedback and make adjustments as we can. Awesome. Uh, so you talked a little bit about each of the, the programs, the cohorts you're running. Can you share, uh, um, maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on the success you're seeing across the three programs, um, and and you know whatever success means for to, for you, whether mm -hmm. that is uh, the engagement that you're seeing with the learners, um, any change in in their output, and how you're you really you're um, shifting the needle across the the different groups here that you're targeting with these programs. Sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with LMI Tech Academy again, self-paced. Um, a big one, we, we have an internal um, uh, Power BI dashboard that was built uh, by Chris Betsy on my team who um, kind of puts all the analytics together. Um, obviously, you know, Chris. And, and so we look at engagement. And so the engagement prior to the LMI Tech Academy um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I want to say that the engagement across our learning platforms was somewhat low. And right now, LMI Tech Academy, now granted it's a smaller organization compared to some of our larger organizations across technology, um, is in the, it's at the height, they're the leading organization as far as um, online learning engagement for the platforms that we uh, have in place, which uh, are about six and six different learning platforms. Um, and it's, it's not only allowed the engagement result, we've also had interviews with the participants and understanding how it's helped build their skills and what um, aspects. And we're hearing a lot of things that a lot of people are getting just in time learning to be able to solve problems that they have um, with their workflow. Um, from, uh, from the Infrastructure Engineer Academy. So the MERN full stack, I'll, I probably should skip that for now because we're not quite all the way through. Um, I do feel like the people that are in the program are, uh, they seem to be um, happy with the, the content and the skills that they're learning. Um, again, we've iterated a lot on that program. Um, and right now we actually just recently asked for feedback on how they're going to use those skills because th there's very different uh, audience in there than some of the other programs. Um, and then from the Infrastructure Academy, uh, Infrastructure Engineer Academy, um, we have, we basically what we do is we work with the managers to understand what they're, what they're, the participants, when they're done, or what are they going to focus on? And then following that, um, we work through to understand after they've been out for uh, 90 to 120 days, we understand, uh, we follow back up with uh, the leadership team that have those folks to understand what business impact they're having. Um, for example, one of the, one of the um, participants in cohort number two in the Infrastructure Engineer Academy has 
But one of the things they came back with is that they've automated a process that would have taken, um, I don't know the, I don't know the exact time, but he's written 13,000 lines of code in, in automation process that has um, reduced the cycle and the spend. I had one other, one other um, situation where uh, they had specced a solution with an outside vendor prior to this person coming out of uh, the engineering academy. When she came back, um, she ended up f- fulfilling the solution, and I think it was a fifty or sixty thousand dollars solution. So it's not not huge money, but this is a skill that this you know this person just picked up through this program and is able to build upon a custom solution. So it's those types of impacts that we're seeing and that we're hearing about, um, and it's also giving people career opportunities and career mobility that they didn't have previously, which I think is the, probably the most important thing in my opinion. This is huge. I mean, the ability for you to um, follow up with the participants in the different cohorts and get this valuable qualitative uh, feedback on how this has actually helped the business is incredible. I, I, I feel that oftentimes we don't get there. You know, we go through a program and we don't really get to a point where we can talk about outcomes. How, what did we, how were we able to um, really help these individuals uh, drive for results? And it's so great to hear um, some of the great success that you've had with these. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. Maybe in closing, I, if, if you were to, you know, share your advice on um, to anybody, anyone who wants to be building these more structured programs, whether it be role-based or priority-based, uh, what would your advice be to them? What, what are some practical uh, best practices you want to share with them uh, that you want them to take away uh, at, from what you've shared so far here? Yeah, so I would say um, leadership buy-in is key, as we mentioned. Um, I feel like that has been one of the one of the key, one of the main keys for success is just the the commitment to learning. Um, it also comes down to providing people time to learn so that they feel comfortable and that they feel supported. Um, that's been a huge challenge, I think, from a lot of organizations, just because you have a backlog of work and it's where do you, where do I fit this in. Um, but you have to look at it as I'm, you're preparing people for not just today, but tomorrow and in the future. Um, I also think that that um, type of support gives people, uh, it helps the, with, the, with the culture of continuous learning. Um, so people, again, feel like, you know, the company's being innovative. It's giving them opportunity and it's also giving them career advancement and mobility opportunities, not just again, not just for the skills that they need on a current project or a future project, but maybe even, uh, you know, we try to support learning in any capacity. And if that means, uh, obviously we want people to to, uh, learn in the space that they're supporting um, as a need, but also in in future needs, um, kind of thinking a little bit outside the box to allow them, you know, space to be able to learn other things. So I would just, it's, it's that whole culture and it's that whole support, I think, is the, is the most important key. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Looping it back into the uh, make your own burritos. Um, <laughs> how, do, how do we close here with that tagline uh, that we had at the front end? Yeah, no, I know. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity. It's been awesome. I mean, our partnership with Pluralsight's been great. So um, really the platform has allowed us to do things we couldn't do years ago. So I really, really love the partnership. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Brad. Sure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye everyone.